Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Tales of Tech live on YouTube. Rocking the Mac OS Sonoma screen capture. I think I've got the hang of it. It took some getting used to, but I think I got it. And I think I love it. Okay, I'm sorry. Those are too much fun. I gotta stop with the animations. Today's live stream, we'll talk about whatever you guys bring up, but I wanted to kick it off with something that didn't, in my opinion, deserve its own video, but was kind of an interesting concept because we got USB-C on the iPhone 15. Thank goodness, the, you know, the best port, the port of the future. Hopefully uh, we can wipe lightning off the face of the earth by the end of the decade. Apple cares more about carbon neutrality. I care more about killing lightning off. Um, but Mark Gurman has been reporting on apparently new MagSafe battery packs that they have in production, which might provide a little bit of context as to why it's not out yet. Um, in the past, Apple has often released new battery cases and then later on battery packs several months after the new iPhones came out. I'm not exactly sure why they do that. I'm not sure of the advantages, but um, they just, I guess, want to give people some time before they're ready for it. Uh, do it, do it. Hey, Viper, how's it going? Hey, Adith. The answer is no. Interesting. Was it something I said? It said yes. Man, you guys and your names, how do you come up with this? If iPad 11 launch, don't buy it. <laughs> Less of yours. Yeah, seriously. I don't think uh, iPad 11 is what we need. I think we need a cheaper iPad 10 and a USB-C Apple Pencil. Um, but essentially, a, a basic version would involve, you know, the exact same battery pack with Type-C. But the more interesting discussion that I've heard talked about is... Um, German explained that a new one is in development. Um, it's not ready to be introduced because the next generation battery pack involves a new concept that could charge, uh, that could allow users to daisy chain multiple battery packs together by stacking them and wirelessly charge multiple devices at the same time. For example, it will be possible to charge two iPhones simultaneously with one placed on either side of the battery pack. <laughs> we'll also, of course, feature a USB C port. So I was like, what? The second I read that, I was like, what are you talking about? That doesn't even make sense in my head. So I'm trying to visualize this. I guess what they're thinking of is trying to incorporate a MagSafe battery pack where one end has the proper magnets to adhere to the back of the iPhone. And then on the back end, it can actually receive a MagSafe charge. So you could, that was a big popular uh, criticism of the MagSafe uh, battery pack when it first came out, you know. I complimented it because I was like, hey, you can use this on any iPhone. You don't have to buy a battery case, which is only going to fit for one generation. And then the following year, you got to buy a whole new case. Um, the idea with the battery pack was that, okay, it's just MagSafe. It's not a full case. So you can just take it off your old iPhone, put it on a new one, or hand it to someone else who has a MagSafe iPhone, and then they can charge off of it. And it's just really simple. But one criticism was that while it could give a wireless charge to your iPhone, it could not receive its own. Um, like you couldn't put a MagSafe puck on the back of that battery pack, or you couldn't leave your iPhone with the MagSafe battery pack um, on your MagSafe Duo and let it charge up because it couldn't receive a wireless charge from the back end. It could actually receive a wireless charge through the iPhone, which was kind of funny. And we didn't even know that when they first announced it, that was found out. Um, the, the iPhone 12 supported that, but we didn't know it until they released the MagSafe battery pack. So actually all, all iPhones from the 12 and on have, excluding the SE, have some kind of reverse wireless charging capability, but it exclusively works with the MagSafe battery pack and nothing else, which is kind of hilarious. Um, so addressing the idea of the battery pack being charged from a different device supports the idea that yes, theoretically you could take another MagSafe battery pack on, and put it behind the, this new one, of course. This wouldn't be backwards compatible, but you could put two, or theoretically, I don't see why you could stop there. Um, maybe two, three battery packs all stacking on top of each other. So you just keep uh, modular, with modularity, being able to add more batteries to the iPhone. There'd be so much energy loss and so much heat generated in the process. But one thing I will mention on the subject, uh, though, of extending your battery capacity for your iPhone 15s. Um, this is another huge reason I wanted a charge limiter. So before, um, the main advantage or the main motivation that kept a lot of people interested in... Sorry, I got a lot of apps. I just realized I haven't closed. Um, the main reason you would want to buy an Apple smart battery case or an Apple MagSafe battery pack, opposed to a third-party, you know, battery case or an anchor... Um, battery pack or whatever is because Apple with all of their 
monopolistic power <laughs> is able to register smart battery cases that are made by them and also the MagSafe battery pack, which is, of course, made by Apple. Um, they could have that behave differently within iOS because iOS would realize, oh, this is an Apple smart battery pack or smart battery case. So it it would still try to preserve the battery or when you're charging the phone, it would preserve the phone's battery and then charge the battery case. Whereas if you used a third party, your iPhone would basically treat that third party battery case or that battery pack as no different from a wall outlet. It would just think, oh, I'm charging right now. I'm plugged in. Um, and the phone behaves a little bit differently. It treats the antennas differently. It treats the installations differently. And of course, it doesn't top off the battery pack and you know it lets the phone go up to 100%. The reason now, though, with the iPhone 15 series that I would argue using a third-party battery pack, which there are, of course, much, much better ones out there. You can look them up. Anchor makes some. There's some that are MagSafe, uh, just like this one that reverse wirelessly charges the iPhone um, and plugs in via Type-C. Those already exist. But the iPhone 15 has a charge limiter, which in my head would actually make a lot of third-party charging accessories not kill your battery that much because... They have a lot more physical capacity. Sure, they're not going to be as smart and as well integrated as Apple's. They have more power dynamic sharing and all that kind of stuff. But the difference is with the charge limiter is that it can just keep your iPhone at 80% instead of 100. And then you don't need to worry too much about that dynamic load sharing of energy. You can just focus on keeping that external battery pack charged up. And then um, the charge limit is still at 80% on your phone. So your phone will basically just sit around at 80% all day. And then um, you can, if your uh, if your battery pack gets low, you can easily pop it off, put on a new one, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, wireless charging is not inherently that bad for your battery health. Um, I exclusively wirelessly charged my phone um, for a full year with the 10s Max, and I was at 100% health. It isn't technically, but it was because, of course, that doesn't exist, really. If you're using your phone, it's not going to be at 100%. But iOS still claimed it was at 100% health after that full year. Um, fast charging is definitely more damaging. Wireless charging does create some excess heat, but it is not inside the phone. It is mostly on the outside. It's the battery you don't want to get super hot, and when you fast charge a phone, that's what degrades the internal battery faster because, of course, the, the heat is coming from the battery pack, not from the outside. Um, new MagSafe battery could be bigger now that they theoretically don't have to support the mini. Oh, that's a good point. The 15 Pro is the smallest MagSafe iPhone now. That's true. Um, yeah, I guess the bezels are a little thinner, so it might even be a tiny bit thinner than the 15. But yeah, that's right. Without a mini, you could make a new ba battery pack, um, that doesn't necessarily fit on the minis. But the problem is the 15 Pro, the camera bump is so huge, you know? Uh, this was just a quick little <laughs> Photoshop I did. I just used subject lift and threw the battery pack on there. But with that bump, it definitely makes it more difficult to fit accessories on the back. That's why I think they got rid of MagSafe Duo, personally. If anything, I would actually encourage them to start moving the, the MagSafe ring down. Maybe it's not perfectly center, but, I mean, that camera bump is just obnoxious. They kind of make it hard to prove my point. Where do I got to go? The buy page? The internal coil also gets heated up if I'm not wrong. Well, both coils get heated up, yes, but the, most of the heat you feel from the phone when you've been wirelessly charging it for a while, that's mostly on the outside. It's not so much the battery that's getting hot. Um, using, using your phone is what <laughs> is worse for the battery life. Um, so if you don't want to hurt your battery health, then don't use your phone. Just leave it in a box and never touch it. My 12 Pro I've had since release is 97% battery health on original battery. Good for you. Congratulations. Charge limiter only for iPhone 15s is a complete joke after the iPad 10. Um, MacBook had this simple feature without stupid based restriction. Well, MacBook, Mac OS doesn't even have the feature. It's a third-party app that Mac OS allows because Mac OS allows sideloading. Um, that's what I still use al dente to keep my battery limit at 50, uh, 80%. But technically, if I'm being honest, there's still no feature in Mac OS natively that allows you to set a charge limit. It's a third party feature that I'm taking advantage of. Why get a MagSafe battery in the first place though? Why not just get a power bank with USB-C? I suppose people don't want like fumbling around with a cable. 
That's one thing I appreciated about the MagSafe battery pack was that you could just slap it on the back and it just starts charging and you just use your phone like normal instead of carrying around this bank and having a wire go between the two. Yeah, it's a little clunky. It's a little annoying. Um, let's see. Why is it dark in my room? I don't know. I figured you didn't need to see that. I didn't turn on the ceiling light, but I'm, I'm actually mostly relying on natural light. There's a lot of sunlight coming in, which is nice. Should I buy a new MacBook now or wait because Apple are releasing Macs this month, but I don't see them releasing M3 chip before Vision Pro? Uh, there's a chance. There's a lot of talk. Um, it depends on what kind of MacBook you're buying. I think personally, if you're on the if you're on the fence about what to get or you're thinking about waiting, I would just tell you to get a refurbished, cheap M1 MacBook Air, um, because then you don't have to worry about uh, M2 versus M3. M1 is still perfectly fine in my opinion. And uh, you can get an M1 MacBook Air for very cheap now. They're getting super affordable. The, the value is hard to beat. Thank you, Chris Norton, for the super chat. I think the batteries being bigger, good, and uh, the battery pack is a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> you're always too generous, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, the, the batteries, honestly, are not that much bigger with the 15s. There were leaks that were not leaks, I guess. Um, there were rumors that the 15s were going to get substantially bigger batteries, and they weren't really that much. But it, it's a wash. You know, like technically, I guess one went up by like 50 milliamp hours, but that's that's such a minor difference. I wouldn't even count that as a bigger battery. It's pretty much exactly the same battery capacities across the board, at least according to Apple on their tech specs page. There is not a single upgrade in battery life. Um, you might watch some battery test where someone's like doing some unrealistic thing with the phone screen on the entire time and switching between a bunch of apps and said, see, technically it lasted a little bit longer that time, but that's not a real life use case. That's not how people use their phones. Um, this is the first time I'm seeing the new Mac live stream feature. I, I like it. I think it's cool. I like being able to show you stuff, but not having to, uh, put me into a little box in the whole object detection in Mac OS works really well in my opinion. Um, I refer to the cycle count thingy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The cycle count thingy you could do on MacBooks for many, many years. And they just added it to iPhones. I think they should add it to everything personally. Um, letting people just know about the state of the battery and the product they're buying. iPad doesn't even get optimized battery charging. Oh my God. When was the last time I used a case with my iPhone? You know, I think the iPhone 11 I have right now came with a case and I tried it for a couple seconds and then I was like, I hate this. This is really uncomfortable. I don't like it. It doesn't go in my pocket very well. So I just took it off pretty uh, pretty quickly afterwards. But if you mean like consistently used one, oh geez, I didn't buy, I definitely never bought a case for my 13 Pro Max. I never bought a case for my 12 mini. Um, I think I did get a couple cases for my 11 Pro Max, so maybe... Maybe I used the razor case for a little while. Um, what the heck? <laughs> Sorry. There's a bunch of animals playing outside. There's like a cat jumping on these vines. I was like, what am I looking at? What's going on out there? <laughs> anyway. Uh, if Apple makes the USB-C MagSafe battery pack and a USB-C MagSafe Duo, when would it be announced? Oh, anytime. I mean, it could be never based on how unconfident Mark Gurman is sounding about it. He's like, don't hold your breath, but they're working on a next generation one that, like you said, could be bigger. But certainly the limiting factor on how big it's going to be is this camera bump. Like, you know what I need? Where's the compare page? We can see how much bigger they could get this. I'm pretty sure it could still get bigger because the Mini was pretty small and they still made the battery pack fit the Mini. So if we put a 15 Pro next to a 13 Mini... So the MagSafe battery pack basically sat perfectly flush with the iPhone 13 mini. And then, man, I need like an overlay feature. Now, yeah, I don't know. Comparing the two, the camera bump is honestly pretty close to lining up. What is this? Oh, that's just open for no reason. It's not doing anything. Let me just open a picture here to compare how close they are. Yeah, okay. It gets a little bit taller. And, you know, the Pro is probably a little bit wider. But see, the MagSafe battery pack on the Mini probably got up to about this point. Where on the Pro, it could go up to about here. Because the 15 Pro is not as small. As, I don't know. Not Probably not as big as you'd think. It probably can't get that much bigger, but a little bit bigger. My guess is that Anchor is still going to be able to crank out a bigger one. Um... 
they already have built a few MagSafe battery packs that have pretty substantially huge milliamp hours. But yeah, that's a good point, Jacob. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, am I back on the 11? Yes, iPhone 15 is gone. Sorry, I didn't update you all on that. It is, it is no longer in my possession. It's just I'm all in on iPhone 11 now. Sorry to those of you who base who you watch <laughs> based on which phone they have. You know, I used to like Drew, but I don't like the fact that he uses an older phone, so I can't watch him anymore. <laughs> that's fine. I would like to lose those viewers if that's how you base your YouTube watching. There are many other YouTubers with much nicer phones than me that you can watch. You have plenty of options. Um, but yes, I'm gone. I'm no longer with the 15. Weird how almost all the good rumors didn't make it to the pro models. <laughs> Well, to me, the biggest one was Type-C. That was the biggest thing, and we got that. So I'm still honestly grateful for that. I know I've critiqued the pros a lot, but I want to give some credit where credit is due. I've wanted Apple to do this for years. And while they didn't quite give it Thunderbolt, they did give it the next best thing, which was 10 gigabit uh, USB-C, which is basically only like one notch down from Thunderbolt. It covers all of the read and write speed capabilities um, of the SSDs, so... I was hoping there might be a little bit more to it than that, and there wasn't, but that's okay. Honestly, the black titanium does look really solid, but I've seen the white titanium in the wild, and I think that's so much more resistant to fingerprints, and it looks great. Um, yeah, Frankie is very disappointed, of course. Um, will I ever try to have a fan meetup? Yeah, I just don't, I can't think of a good way to do it. I like the spontaneous ones where I just kind of run into someone in public that has seen my videos and then we catch up a little bit. But if I if I ever did like a, a scheduled one, I, I don't visualize it going very well because you would probably, I can really only talk to a couple people in person at a time. And if we had even even a small crowd, even if only 10 people showed up, then it would still just be like, I can't, I can't get to know and, and have an in-depth conversation with that many people. Uh-oh. What's wigging out? T-Mobile's wigging out. I'm all pixelated. What the heck? What's going on? Do I need to close Chrome? Is, cl is Chrome sabotaging my stream? We lost all the pixels. Sometimes T-Mobile, I'm using T-Mobile home internet. Sometimes it wigs out like this. It's not, con it's not consistently bad enough for me to cancel the service, but it usually recovers after just a couple seconds. So just give it a minute and it should, should go back to normal. Um, Let's see. Can iPhone even handle Thunderbolt speeds? Doubt the internal storage on iPhones can handle 40 gigabit speeds. Well, your MacBook can't either. Your MacBook maxes out at a read and write speed of about six or seven gigabits per second, but you notice your MacBook still has Thunderbolt. Um, no, the main reason you want to do Thunderbolt is primarily for external monitor and data. It's like doing a bunch of things all at once. That's the main advantage Apple likes about Thunderbolt is you can just have one cable plugged into your Mac and an external monitor, and that mo so your Mac can be outputting a 6K, 60 hertz resolution, and simultaneously be doing data all through that one port, which is why there were rumors, you know, there was talk from Ming-Chi Kuo and Mark Gurman about maybe even getting Thunderbolt on the iPhones. So I got excited for those rumors because I was like, okay, if it's Thunderbolt, that means they're doing more than just faster data transfer speeds. Because I was honestly not that excited at the concept of just having faster data transfer speeds. Like, that was not a huge deal to me. Because I'm like, eh, it's an iPhone. I'm usually not... I'm not a... I don't typically record on my phone with ProRes. I didn't do it when I had the 13 Pro Max. I can't do it now with my iPhone 11. But that's fine. Because when I, when I tested it, I didn't notice a huge difference. And I color corrected it and compared HEVC to ProRes, and I was like, it's just not that big a deal. It's the same sensor. It's the same lens. Um, so yeah, I had a harder time getting excited for faster data transfer speeds, but I was excited for the concept of Thunderbolt because that meant there would be some other thing like an Apple DeX or even like is the is the new Apple Silicon in the iPhone so fast that you could boot Mac OS off of it. Theoretically, there's nothing preventing that. Um, if Apple really wanted to boot Mac OS off of an A17 chip, they totally could. There's no question in my mind. There's Mac OS running on much worse chips right now. And um, they were able to put Mac OS on the Mac Mini Dev Kit, which had an A12Z chip. And that was like nothing compared to what they're putting in the A17 Pro. So uh, they could have done something like that. And that's what I was interested in. More of a feature, not just a spec bump. Uh, because I 
don't typically transfer that many files between my my charge port on my phone. Um, and we didn't quite get that, but still, it's nice that you can record straight to external SSDs. That's pretty cool. And um, it's cool that they put on basically the fastest USB-C port that is not Thunderbolt on the new phones, which was impressive. Um, last year, we thought you were going through a phase and would be back on 15 Pro by now. Maybe it's time for an intervention. <laughs> I think it is, Demitha. <laughs> it is. Hi, Nation. What's good, man? The weather. It's very nice where I'm living right now. It's not too hot, not too cool. I just... It, I don't have a fan running today. It's just it's just nice. It just feels great. Since UK isn't part of the EU anymore, I still hope it gets sideloaded. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's it, Sideloading is a very easy thing to software lock based on location, so I wouldn't be shocked. Nicholas Linthicum says, maybe Apple is waiting for Qi 2 to come worldwide so the new accessories would be Qi 2 certified. Yeah, I thought that was already a thing. I thought that standard had already been agreed upon. Honestly, that's one thing about the Pixel 8s that I was a little disappointed by. I was like, I thought they would have had Qi 2 by now because the wireless charging consortium, whatever that organization group is called, had kind of agreed on a design for Qi 2, which is basically just MagSafe. It's the exact same thing. You can make knockoff MagSafe super easy. Like, um, making a knockoff lightning connector is a little bit more complicated, but nothing about MagSafe is really that proprietary. The only thing that's kind of proprietary about it is the little NFC notification that you get. If you use, like, the Find My Wallet, you know, like, you put the wallet on the back of your phone, and your phone knows it's a wallet. So it has that Find My integration. It remembers when it was disconnected and stuff. But outside of the little NFC that says, hey, a case has been attached or a battery pack has been attached, it's really just a ring of magnets and wireless charging. It's still just Qi coils. So you can spoof that very, very simply. You can just put some magnets in a pixel with a wireless charging coil. And because they're not necessarily marketing it as MagSafe, Apple can't sue them for it. They're not using Apple's terminology, but it could work exactly the same it would magnetically attach right in the middle and give it a wireless charge it's really it's smart it's a clever design and i'm very thankful that magsafe is a thing that was one of those kind of surprise like oh i didn't consider that kind of releases an iphone 12 it wasn't leaked all that much it wasn't talked about very much but once i saw it i was like that's really smart you know with all these accessories we put on the back of our phones there should be just some magnets built in there by default that allow us to attach things and also charge it more securely. Um, let's see. The phone is so four years ago. Maybe Frank ought to talk to you about your old school ways. He does every day. Um, let's see. Am I using the studio light camera mode on your Mac or do you actually have a light source in front of you? I just have a window next to me. That's my light source. If I go in here. No, there's no studio light. That's this is just naturally how it looks. Um, let me turn on studio light so you can see the difference. Yeah, that's that makes me look a little too white, which I didn't think was possible. <laughs> but I think this looks better. I think it looks nicer off. Personally, I don't know what you guys think, but it's the EU quality standard. The UK tried to replace it with UKCA, but gave up. OK, so maybe that's. Maybe that means they do have to change it in there, too. Why would Google adopt Apple's standard when Apple won't adopt RCS? Google is salty. <laughs> well, I thought Google was trying to be like, we're better than that. We're bigger than that. Like, we, we're not trying to play the walled garden approach. That's why Android's more open, you know. I don't think Google's trying to become just like Apple. Otherwise, they wouldn't allow Android on, you know, <laughs> other smartphones. But... Google is very much not like Apple, but they're trying to copy, I think, the better attributes of Apple while still keeping some of their more positive attributes, trying to be more open and accessible. Or um, So I was honestly very impressed with the Pixel 8 announcement. You know what? The reason I think I was more impressed with the Pixel 8 was because I didn't watch the keynote. I still haven't, by the way. I've had the opportunity to. I was like, you know what? I'm kind of interested in those Pixel phones. Maybe I should watch the presentation. And then I remembered every time I watch one of those Pixel events, it's just cringy and embarrassing. And it makes you just go like, oh, geez, this is nothing like an Apple event. So I was like, you know what? I want to be interested in the hardware, but I don't want the marketing to taint my view of the phone upgrades because everything on paper, at least everything I was reading looked really impressive. I was like, okay, good trade-in values, amazing cameras, new silicon, 
Um, great displays, decent designs. They finally got rid of the stupid curved display thing that always bothered me, and that's why I wasn't terribly interested in the 7 Pro either. And then it felt like, okay, they're being a lot more serious now that they're at least publicly saying that they're going to commit to seven years of feature updates. I was like, that's impressive. That's uh, Apple doesn't even technically commit to that. Apple doesn't promise you any number of years of support. They just have a track record of providing many years of support, but they don't commit to anything. And I thought a lot of people kind of jumped on the Google bandwagon quickly, like, well, Google doesn't commit to things. Google kills things all the time. And I'm like, yeah, but they don't, they usually don't like promise a timeline like that and then cancel the timeline. Yes, Google launches a lot of services and stuff, but they don't like launch a service and say, this service is going to exist for the next 10 years. No, they just launch a service and say, here it is. And then it doesn't do very well. And then they can it. So I don't know. I've I feel like they're probably right with their promise on the seven years of support. I think they're probably going to stay consistent with that because unlike a lot of the other Google hardware things that they've done over the years, they're actually staying pretty consistent with the Pixel phones. There's a lot of things they didn't stay consistent with, whether it be Stadia or the Chromebooks or the Pixel books or any of that crap. But they have stayed very consistent with like every year dropping a new Pixel and Yes, they made a lot of weird decisions with those earlier pixels that I still stand by all my criticisms with. But every year it feels like they listen a little bit more and they iron out the details a little bit more. Why don't I get up some pixel? Hold up. What can I look up? Made by Google? Or is it? No, it's store.google. That's what I'm thinking of. Get some shots here. Some, like background B-roll. I don't know. I thought I thought the lineup looked pretty good. I was a little, I probably could have done more critiquing on the Pixel Watch because I noticed that they made the Pixel Watch worse in a lot of ways. Um, they like downgraded it, but they also didn't lower the price, which is kind of weird. Pixel Pass got canceled literally right before the first people would get a new phone. Yeah, but they followed it up with that. Um, they didn't say Pixel Pass will exist for the next five years. You know, they just launched it, but they didn't think much about it. But they did reach out to the people on Pixel Pass and offered them discounts and upgrades and stuff. They did follow up with that. Harrison2, thank you for the super chat. Says, you make amazing content. If you could add one feature to the iPhone that would convince you to instantly upgrade and stay, what would it be? I get... <laughs> thank you for the donation, but... I get that question so much, and that's just it. I don't know. I can't think of anything, and that's why I'm using a four-year-old iPhone is <laughs> because I can't think of anything, and Apple can't think of anything, <laughs> so therefore, that's why I'm not upgrading. Um, I tried the iPhone 15, and I thought it was a great phone, and I would recommend it to many people. If you watch my iPhone 15 review, there was almost nothing bad I could say about it. I was like, this is a great phone. It's just that my old phone isn't that bad. Um, and I, and I keep trying to push that narrative on this channel best I can, because in the today's tech world, we have so many channels all trying to convince you that you have problems and there are solutions and the solutions are purchases and you need to buy, 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 buy another thing, buy this, buy or that, buy, if you really like Android for this and you really like iOS for that, okay, then buy both. Okay. Have two flagship phones and then upgrade both of them. And then a galaxy phone is going to come out in a couple of months, buy that too. And we're just in this consumerist culture that is constantly trying to tell you to buy things. And I think that's not what most people need to hear. What more people need to hear is that your upgrade should not be based on how good the new phone is. It should be based on how bad your old phone is. And as long as the feature differences are fairly small year over year, where there's not that many changes and there's not many features that are unlocked by the new phone, then I'm going to continue pushing that recommendation, which is just that how bad is your current phone? That's what you should be asking, not how good is the new phone. The new phones are great, but I've been without my iPhone 15 for many days now, and I haven't really missed it all that much. You know, USB-C is nice to have on there, but I pretty much exclusively wirelessly charge. So I'm, I'm either, my phone's on the Pixel stand, ironically. The old Pixel stand is so much better, I may add. What happened with the Pixel stand? What did they do to, where is it? Where's the charger? Uh, fix this compatibility. I want a charger. Rands? Huh? These are all cases. Oh, come on. That is a straight up Nike band. What are we to What are we doing here? Um, I want it to have this thing. This one. What did they do here? This looks so much worse, in my opinion. 
it's all thick and chunky. And it's like got the two tone. There's like a panel gap on it. Where's a good picture of it? They don't have any great shots of it. That looks so much worse in my opinion than look at the look at the old pixel stand. I still use it. It's even back when it came out, I, I highly recommended it. Like this is great. It's so clean. It's so much sleeker. I mean, mine isn't clean. I'm sorry. I haven't cleaned it in a while. But the USB-C port is like hidden at the bottom in this little circle. And that keeps it like secure. So even if it gets unplugged, it doesn't like the cable doesn't fall out. And it works great in both portrait and landscape. So every night, like when I go to bed, I just put my phone. Oh, this is hard to show, isn't it? I put it on its side. And if you hold it, really still it'll activate the um you have to be like really still but it will activate the nightstand thing maybe it's because i'm holding it it's not still enough but take my word for it you know how the ios 17 nightstand thing works it's great and it works when i put the phone sideways it can charge my airpods upright as well so it's just the vertical you know it's at the right orientation so that my phone is pointed at me for face id and stuff like that it's so much better looking um they made the stand way thicker i don't know if there's some advantage to that it's not cheaper it's still the same 80 bucks it supports up to 23 watts for compatible pixel phones um so i guess it's a little bit faster i think this old pixel stand charges it like uh, 15 watts at peak. But anyway, to answer your question, Harrison, um, I, I struggle, I guess, I guess if they made the camera better than my black magic, which it's still pretty good, but it's not better. Um, yeah, it's $80. That's what it says right there. I mean, Apple doesn't really make a vertical wireless charging stand. They rely on the third parties, but Still, I don't I don't like this design more at all. You know, for a while I thought it'd be interesting to see the iPhone get an Apple, you know, Dex like feature where you can dock it with an external monitor and it unlocks all these crazy things. But I gotta be honest, even with that, you know, I I work from home. So it's not like it's not like um I travel to work and would plug my phone into a monitor and then go home and plug it into a different monitor. No, I would use it in the exact same place. And then when I go on trips, I'm not going to be able to pack a monitor with me everywhere I go. So the MacBook is still going to be a better solution to me, even if even if the next iPhone booted into Mac OS, even if it supported fully fledged Mac OS when connected to an external monitor and everything, it still probably wouldn't make that much sense compared to just using my MacBook. Um, Let's see. Use the second gen stand on my bedside table. It has a fan inside of it. You can turn the fan down or off. So it gets that hot? You need a fan? I'm um, just saying I probably would have preferred a more diminutive design that supported landscape mode. Oh, yeah. Does the new one not support landscape? Would the always-on display still work on the iPhone without the stand? What if I simply charge the phone with a cable and turn it in landscape? Would always-on still work? I mean, functionally, it could work on any screen. It's just Apple's more worried about burn-in and power consumption, I guess. Um, with OLED phones, it's a bigger concern because if you show the same thing all the time at a high rate of power, it's more likely to damage the display, whereas if it can get down to one hertz, then it's not a big deal. Very low power consumption, very little strain on the display. Um, but yeah, always on displays are not a new thing. There's just Apple has a very strict way of supporting it. Apple's like, the only way we're going to do always on is if we can get the power consumption really, really low, like to down to one hertz. And uh, but there were phones I remember back in 2013, 2014 that had always on displays. They just used a lot more power idling. Um, you can set the stand to charge at max and it kicks the fan on or it is really effective at keeping the phone cool whilst charging. I just don't want to hear any noise from my wireless charger. Weird to think how iPhone's got a charge limiter before the MacBooks. <laughs> yeah, there's third-party options for the MacBooks, but yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, honestly, it makes more sense, though, because smaller batteries like iPhone batteries tend to degrade a bit faster. MacBook batteries are larger, so and MacBooks can pull power straight from the wall and not touch the battery like mine is right now, so 
less reason to worry about MacBook battery health. But yeah, I, I agree. It should still have an option. Um, the Apple guy says hot take promotion is overrated for what it is. It doesn't improve battery life. Promotion on the 14 Pro Max, excuse me, and M1 iPad Pro deactivates after low power mode is on. I use power low power mode every time. I agree. I, and I'm someone who really appreciates 120 hertz. I love a buttery smooth refresh rate. Don't get me wrong. I notice it right away. Anytime I use a newer iPhone, like uh, my mom's, or I go to an Apple store, like I'll, I'll play around with the pros and I notice it. Um, I appreciate it and notice it, but I understand that it's not like everyday people are going to notice. I bet, I bet most of the people with pro iPhones don't even realize that they have that. They're just, um, <laughs> they're just buying the pro phone because they're like, well, it's only a little bit more and the camera's probably better or the battery's better or something. I don't know, but they don't, if they saw side by sides, they probably wouldn't care that much about the cameras. They're just like, well, I'm going to buy this and hold on to it for a while. So, um, they really should bring the iPhone 15 battery features to older phones. Um, let's see. The pixel stand has some kind of functionality, functionality where it tries to turn your phone into a little nest speaker type thing. I believe that. I mean, Apple's kind of doing that with the standby feature. Um, imagine releasing a new phone, and one of the first problems people complain about is the tendency too quickly to overheat. Fan these iPhone Pros. <laughs> yeah, they they got to put active cooling systems. That's the next big thing, right? Maybe the Ultra can get that. Nation says, back wearing the watch. Yeah, unfortunately, there were multiple instances where people were trying to get a hold of me. And I was not accessible because I didn't have my watch on and I didn't get the notification when I was supposed to, or I left my phone a little bit too far away from me and I wasn't checking it. And there's just, you know, life stuff comes up, but it's not specifically anything the Series 7 is rocking. Like, I, I'm i using my watch differently now. Like, I'm really just wearing it as a form of, like, if someone needs to get a hold of me for any emergency, you know, there's family stuff going on and things I need to be available for but if i'm with family or if i'm with people that i'm you know need to be in contact with i i'll take it off and stuff so i'm you'll probably see me wearing it when i'm working but that's just because if I, in the middle of a stream or in the middle of working i get a text that something important's going on and someone needs me or needs my help i got to be able to sign off really quick and head out but um if it weren't for that i wouldn't be wearing the watch basically i'm not tracking activities i'm not doing any sleep tracking um, you know, I'm just, I could be doing the exact same thing with the series two. If I had one, I could just wear that. Um, I'm still actively trying to sell the series seven, so I could definitely live without it. Um, could you live without an iPhone and only with an Apple watch? No, I think I would die immediately. <laughs> I just dropped it. No, of course I could get by. Um, but it wouldn't be ideal. I wouldn't have a camera. It'd be harder to get into my car be harder to control my car because I control so much of my car through my phone now. Um, it'd be harder to communicate with people. It would take longer. Um, there's a lot of third-party apps I need to use that would be not be as accessible if I didn't have my phone. So yeah, sorry. iPhone definitely takes priority and you can't really have an Apple Watch without an iPhone. Even if I got cellular on the watch, I would still have to have an iPhone plan. So it's kind of a waste of a exercise. I've tried it in the past. I did those exercises where it's like, let's just do just the Apple Watch and you leave your phone behind. And it's like, yeah, you you can do it, but I don't think it's better. And the real truth is it's just not that hard to bring a phone with you. If if I felt like substantially lighter and it unlocked so much more freedom and flexibility to not have my phone on me, then I'd be more interested in it. In it. But it really doesn't. It's just like you have pockets you take your wallet and your keys with you anyway, just throw your phone in there while you're at it. It's not that hard. Um, let's see. Uh, when I got my 15 pro max, maybe I could start making breakfast without my stove. Oh yeah. It gets hot enough. That's true. Um, it's pretty weird to see a tech YouTuber have an older phone than my phone, but I have a lot more respect for you because of that. Oh, thanks Martin Joe. I have respect to you for you for respecting me. Um, standby definitely works without, um, a stand Saturday. I showed it to one of the Apple employees who was doing tips in the store. It blew his mind. <laughs> yeah. It just needs power and to be on its side. I, when I was traveling, I had the iOS 17 beta 
and I would be in a lot of places where I was just, I didn't have a good place to put a wireless charger or anything. So I just plug in my iPhone and leave it on its side and it would be in standby mode. And I was like, oh, that's kind of nice. Um, a lot of YouTubers won't even ponder the idea that you could buy a phone from last year. We'll only compare the 15 to the S23 to the Pixel 8. Don't mention you can find a Pixel 7 for $350 resale. <laughs> I thought about that a lot, right? Because I was like, these Pixel 8s actually look pretty good. And I knew that, you know, some people might take my recommendation, might say like, wow, even Apple Sheep Drew is impressed. Um, but I did think about how many years of support are coming to the Pixel 7, and it is substantially less. I don't know. I mean, there's there's less updates promised. Maybe they'll go beyond their promise, but it's Google, so I have a harder time believing that. Um, but yeah, with the Pixel 7, I believe they promised like five years of security updates, but only like three or four years of feature updates. And the Pixel 7 is already a year old. So if you're buying one now, yeah, you can find it for a lot cheaper, but you're probably looking at two or three years of features. Whereas with the Pixel 8, at least you'd be looking at I mean, the bigger incentive to get a new Pixel 8, I think, would be the trade-in deals. Apple's trade-in is so crap. <laughs> it's not even worth considering. I wouldn't recommend anybody trade in their phone with Apple unless something is kind of wrong with the phone and you don't want to deal with trying to find, you know, a, a third party that'll buy it that will be okay with the cosmetic issues, like it's a little damaged or something. Um Trade-in is always just the easiest because it typically means you can just hand the phone over to them and they'll just take it and give you the credit. And there's no, usually no haggling and too much of a problem. But um, when it comes to like uh, selling a phone, you typically get way more money than what Apple trade-in credit will give you, but it takes a little bit longer to find the buyer. and Or if you ship it, that adds to the cost of selling it and everything. But the Pixel trade-in credits were absurd. It was ridiculous. It didn't make any sense, particularly for iPhones. So it was kind of funny to see in real time how much more Google wanted iPhone users to switch. I didn't even think it had much to do with resale value. A lot of people are like, oh, see, Google and Samsung are acknowledging that um, iPhones are worth more than Androids. And I'm like, I don't even think it's that because they're not, they're not making money on this. If I went to the uh, Pixel store... And, uh, which I'm going to right now, hanging on to a pixel until 2030 is a good idea. Well, I don't know. I feel like they're getting better. And, uh, I saw interviews saying that, uh, power efficiency and performance was a big emphasis on the new G3 chip. So we don't have it yet. We don't, we don't know how much better it is, but I do feel like we're getting to a point where it's like, okay, in my opinion, it's kind of stupid to write off a phone CPU because it's not as fast as the newest iPhone CPU. It's like, okay, dude, iPhone CPUs have been crazy fast for years. And for what most of us use our phone for, we're not even maxing out those chips. You know when the A13 chip came out, the A13 chip that's in my iPhone 11 right now? They're bragging about how that chip can record 4K video from three separate lenses at once. From the ultrawide, the telephoto, and the main lens. When we can record three times and cut between them in Filmic Pro. That was a four-year-old chip. Okay, so it... If you're going to use the old argument of, well, iPhone chips are faster, it's like, okay, at a certain point, though, that, that performance doesn't translate to anything if we're all using our phones for social media, taking pictures, because this is still great at that. <laughs> Excuse me. And just, you know, you want it to be fairly power efficient, but the Pixels have even bigger battery capacities than the iPhones anyway, so they can even compensate for having a less efficient chip and all that stuff. Um, so if I, if I plug in a Pixel 8 Pro... My trade-in credit for my iPhone 11 is actually higher than a trade-in. Okay, rather than say this, I'll let you guys look at it because it's just amazing. Okay, unlocked. Let's get estimate. So let's thank you for uh, the super chat, Franco, by the way. How's your T-Mobile home internet working out these days? It's pretty good. It's the cheapest Wi-Fi I've ever had, so I can't complain all that much. The reliability is a little questionable. As you guys saw earlier in the stream, sometimes the quality dips a little bit. Um, but that doesn't happen that consistently. Sometimes I'll go weeks and never see it do that. Sometimes it'll do it multiple times within one stream. And then I'm just like, hey, what the heck? What's going on? But it's consistent and reliable enough that I'm not willing to go to Comcast because their speeds are going to be way slower and they're going to charge me way more. Or Starlink, because the reliability of the Starlink signal for live streaming was not stable enough for me. 
honestly, that was really the only issue. I could upload videos with Starlink and the download was great. It was just the live stream tended to cut out pretty regularly and it was getting consistent enough that it was like unbearable and starlink costs more than twice as much as t-mobile so t-mobile's not perfect but i'm willing to put up with it because it's only 50 bucks a month whereas everything else i want to use is going to be well over 100 bucks a month anyway hope that answers your question so let's say you're pre-ordering a pixel 8 pro right you go to the trade-in area okay I'm a big fan of Android, right? I got the best of the best Android phone. I got a Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 4, like basically the latest generation foldable, one of the newest generation foldables that cost me like $2,000. And I I went even more above $2,000. I bought the one terabyte Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 4. How much is the trade-in credit for that Android phone? Oh, 360 bucks for like a $2,000 Android phone. The trade-in credit is 360 bucks. Okay, let's do it again. Let's say Apple. I have a four-year-old uh, 2019 iPhone 11. The storage, I got the base model, 64 gigs. You know, at the time, I thought that was going to be enough storage. So I just got 64 gigs. 440 bucks. They give you almost... $80 more trade-in credit for a phone that is objectively worth so much more, uh, sorry, so much less than Z Fold. There is no way that they're basing this off of some kind of resale value. This is purely Google subsidizing the phone if you're willing to trade in an iPhone because they know that iPhone users are less likely to switch or are going to have a harder time switching. So they're trying to literally make the phone a better deal if you're an iOS user. And if you're an Android user, eh, we already got you. You're already using Google services, so we don't care that much about getting you over. So to me, that trade-in calculator was amazing, by the way. It just kind of blew my mind. Um, so I feel like I feel like Google is definitely losing money on those trade-in deals and especially with the pre-order discounts cuz you know if you if you hit add trade in here um down here if you pre-order you, they'll give you Pixel Buds Pro or they'll give you a Pixel Watch 2 which ordinarily would cost $350 they let you buy it for uh, they let you have it for free they got to be losing money on this um just because I give them an iPhone 11 which in the in the resale market you know i've been looking at them like how much our iphone 11 is going for these days just in you know just in case if i broke my iphone 11 or dropped it or something i you can find it for like 200 bucks so they're de they're definitely subsidizing the equipment based on what kind of phone you bring in so in their mind an ios customer is far more valuable than an android customer because they're not getting as much data from the ios customers so the trade-in deals are pretty nutty, in my opinion. In my opinion, <laughs> um, apparently Google is willing to give me two hundred dollars for my Pixel Four A, which is very generous considering it costs ninety dollars to buy in the used market. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah, I know a lot of people that have done that, where they like buy something used and then someone recently I talked to buy, bought a an Android phone for like fifty bucks and then got like nine hundred dollars in trade-in credit <laughs> or something. Yeah, Apple will give you $200 for an iPhone 11. Google will give you $440, which is hilarious. Um, I'd switch immediately if they had those trade-in deals here. <laughs> yeah, it's different, though, depending on which phone you buy, which is interesting. So the Pixel 8 Pro gives me $440 of credit with the iPhone 11. Now, let's... So, of course, when I first saw that, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So are you telling me if I went to the Google store... And let's say I wanted the Pixel 7, which is only um, 6. Oh, no, wait. That's not the example. 7a is what I was thinking. The Pixel 7a is only 499 right? So for 4, four are you telling me I can get a Pixel 7a for like 60 bucks? Uh, so I say, yeah, let's get an estimate. I plug in Apple. I plug in iPhone 11. 64 gigs. It's in good condition. Now the trade-in credit's $260. So it's like nearly half the trade-in credit purely because I'm buying a less expensive phone. So the more phone you buy from them, the more incentive they give you to bring in your old phone because iPhone 11 is definitely not worth 440 bucks. Um, let's see. 
I just put the iPhone 13 as trade in, but I'm in Canada. It gives me $380 Canadian. That's like $280 US. That's not great. But which which phone are you trying to pre-order? Because it's different depending on which one you select. Um, the 8 Pro is what they subsidize the most. Um, they tend to treat smartphone market like a contest. They can only have one winner instead of trying to find the right phone for the right person. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's a clear winner. I mean, it just depends on what you're looking for. I mean, for a lot of people, the iPhone's the winner, but I think a lot of that comes down to software. I think a lot of people buy the new iPhone simply because their old phone isn't doing very well. It's not because the new iPhone had some feature they really cared about. They were just like, eh, this one's getting kind of old and kind of slowing down. I think I'm ready to try a new one. Let's see what happens if you do a uh, iPhone 13 for the Pixel 8 Pro. Let's just go base model, keep it simple. $500, wow. <laughs> $500 trade-in credit if you trade in an iPhone 13. That's funny. Yeah, you'll get different trade-in credits if you just do the regular Pixel 8. I've I've tried that. Um, that's interesting, though, that you can get twice the storage for only $60 more. Usually, it's more like $100. And then $1,270 for $512, huh? Um, is my brother Frankie a ghost? No comment. I got an extra six Canadian for the Pixel 8 Pro. Extra six dollars. Whoa! What a saving. Divot says, are you ordering one? Maybe. You might have to wait and see. Google Pixel Watch looks kind of disgusting, to be honest. I don't mind the look. It's more of the user interface that annoys me. Round watches don't look bad. It's usually the user interface doesn't function as well, um, which is why I'm grateful that Apple doesn't make a circular watch. But, you know, I'm not trading your old watch and save. I didn't even know that. They you, Can I trade in my Apple Watch for a Pixel Watch? That'd be kind of hilarious. Um, the black looks nice. Let's just keep it simple. Trade in your device. Oh, yeah. Apple Watch Series 7. 105. <laughs> That's not very good. Jeez. Yeah, I didn't expect the trade-in credit. I, I thought maybe they would care more if I was an Apple Watch user. I didn't even play with that before. Huh, what if it's a Ultra? $175 for an Ultra trade-in. Jeez. That's still not great if you consider most people spent, you know, like $800 on that watch. Um, trading in a Pixel 7 Pro for a Pixel 8 Pro gives you 347 pounds trade-in value. Interesting. Okay, I like how everybody's now playing with the trade-in calculator. I believe they changed the charge connector on the back to be pins instead of inductive, which I don't understand. Um, whoops, sorry, too far. These other colors here. I don't know. I haven't tried the Pixel Watch, but I know Marquez didn't like it. I watched Marquez's video, and he's usually more of the Google guy. So I was like, well, if Marquez doesn't like it, I'm definitely not going to like it. But I don't know. You guys tend to like it when I don't like tech products. So maybe I should try it even if I don't like it. Just because then I can articulate your frustrations. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe a little birdie will drop a Pixel 8 on my doorstep. And we'll uh, we'll see if I like it. And maybe if I like it, I'll consider reviewing a watch. Google aren't taking trade-ins on the Watch 2 in the UK. Much to my annoyance, I would upgrade otherwise. Really? I don't think it's worth it, personally. I, I would definitely... I mean, I don't need my Series 7. But I would definitely not trade in my my watch for 105 bucks <laughs> that I could sell it for way more than that easily. Uh, Archie gamer tech super chatted any insight on the 15 pro battery issue. I didn't know there was a battery issue. I know there was a heating issue. Is that what you meant? The heating issue I think has mostly been addressed by the new iOS 17 update. At least I don't have a 15 pro, so I can't comment on it. I can only tell you what other people have told me. Um, but I've heard it's better after the latest updates. So I don't, I don't know. When you first set up a phone, it's doing a lot of background tasks and installing a lot of apps and stuff. So that'll probably heat up the battery. And over, uh, when you first get a new phone, it's probably going to be kind of hot. Um, let's see. The new processor in the watch promises much better battery life. I would upgrade for that. Well, that's good. So it's a trade off. Is there a compare page for the watches? I haven't researched as much. Um, I like trade in your old watch. I never saw that before. Um, 
compare. I'm looking for. Oh yeah, the first gen watch. Did they discount that? Fitbits. Fitbit still exists. Just the regular watch is still 280. Um, same size, same Gorilla Glass. Um, irregular heart rhythm notifications. Oh, really? They just got that. I like how they just put the compare page right here. Fall detection. Where have I seen that before? Um, it's funny that they didn't bring up battery life. I can't go back to 60 hertz, and I tried, and I just could not last a day. It's very hard for the first couple of weeks. As someone who has crossed that path myself, it was very hard. I went from the 13 Pro Max to the iPhone 10, and the 60 hertz was jarring for quite a while. But I forced myself. I was just like, it's just a phone. You just use it for work. You just use it for communication. It doesn't need to be the prettiest thing on earth. And I honestly really liked the, the feel of the iPhone 10 in the hand. Um, it felt a heck of a lot more comfortable than the super heavy 13 Pro Max, but that refresh rate was a little annoying for a while, but I got used to it, and now I don't even think about it. It's just become the phone, the regular phone again. Um, so what do they have for... It's weird that they don't mention battery life much. Productivity, connectivity, sensors. Huh. Weird. All day tracking, right? We'll just take your... Yeah, why would they not list battery life? I, I believe you when you say it's better. I just think it's weird that they wouldn't say that. Like, here's how many hours versus this one. Um, It was software related. <laughs> so they software locked the better battery life. Um, The worst thing is even though they own Fitbit now. They still keep Google Health and Fitbit separate. That thing I like about the Apple Watch is that everything is bundled in one app. Yeah, that would definitely annoy me if I had two different health things to keep track of. Um, let's see. Anyone else have an iPhone that rebooted last night without an update? I think you're getting hacked, Quentin. I did hear that the 15 Pro Max overheating, but I have heard the Pro Max has a new hand warming feature over the older models. Oh, so clever. It's a feature, not a bug. I like that. Um, let's see, he didn't send a follow-up. I think it's possible to buy a Pixel 8, trade in my 4A, and then return the Pixel 8 to get a better profit. <laughs> Usually they're pretty smart about that kind of thing. Um, so I would be surprised if they didn't think of that type of thing. The battery life estimate is a bit meh. They say the new one will get 24 hours with always on display, but I have the old one and I get 24 hours with always on display. That's funny. My guess is the battery life is not that different between the two. So I guess that makes it hard to recommend the new watch. I still think this tablet idea is really good, but I never ended up checking it out. Anyway, sorry this has turned into such a uh, Pixel Boy stream. Um... I think it's possible to buy... Oh, sorry, I read that. Um, that blue is so nice. Literally my favorite shade of my favorite... Uh, the bay blue? Yeah, I like it too. There's a lot of blue phones, that's for sure. At least they can get colors on their headphones. AirPods still don't come in different colors. That's got to be intentional, right? It's like Apple totally could have made multiple color options for the AirPods by now. It must be an active decision. Ooh, see? There's another hideous pixel stand. I do not like this. I personally was underwhelmed when I upgraded to 120 hertz for the first time, but I don't know, maybe it's me or my vision or whatever. Some people say they can't ever go back. I barely notice. Most people I've talked to barely notice. There's very rarely do I find people that can actually tell the difference. Um, overheating, overheating issue with the 15 Pros was confirmed to be because of poor software optimization that meant certain apps were running. Yeah, that's what I heard as well. It was just one of those launch day bugs. There's always launch day bugs. I feel like everyone forgets that. Every year there's something. Every year they're like, oh, this is a little weird. Oh, this is a little weird. And you always notice it right when it first comes out, but then everyone keeps buying it. It doesn't really change much. Um, of course, there's not even many games on mobile that support 120 hertz. I'm definitely more sensitive to frame rate on console or PC gaming. On the phone, it's bare barely more noticeable than placebo. Yeah, it's it's pretty close, especially because we're not playing those kinds of games on our phones anyway. Um, Simon says, my 15 Pro Max did freeze up yesterday for no reason. At the lock screen, it took about a minute for it to start responding again. Some weird bugs this year. 
Um, I think it happens every year. We just don't have a very good memory. But I mean, I can recall pretty much every iPhone launch is followed by some kind of gate, even if it's a small software thing that was just like, oh, yeah, there was a little bug when it first came out and then they fixed it in a week. And then we forget about it because we've used our phones much longer than a week. But in the moment, it feels like, oh, this is the biggest. Oh, man, the quality control is so bad. Apple's never been like this before. It's just you don't remember those little things because they're so short. Um, I can't help but uh, staying afraid of radiation when having a smartwatch on me. I feel so much better disabling all connections. I'd love to hear your take on that. I'm no radiation expert, so I'm probably not the person who should be explaining it or talking to you. But as far as I understand it, there are FCC guidelines on the correct amount of radiation devices are allowed to emit, and they would not allow them to be sold if they were inherently more dangerous um, than any other object. I mean, everything, almost everything on Earth gives off a certain amount of radiation. Uh, you want to avoid objects that give off more radiation than others, um, but radiation levels have to be excruciatingly tested and um, analyzed before the phone can be even or the watch can even enter production um so i don't think it's i i think you'd be seeing a lot bigger problems basically if it was i've been wearing a watch for a very very long time um and you'd be noticing more issues if they did emit some kind of radiation uh that was at a dangerous level so that's the best way i know how to explain it but i don't think it's a problem um you could multiply the radiation coming off the phone 100x and it's still not even close to the radiation you absorb from the sun when you go outside. Yes, I've heard that before. If you're worried about radioactive uh, material or uh, gamma rays and that kind of thing, the sun is going to be far more damaging than any tech product usually. I've also heard uh, microwaves. If you just stand somewhat near a microwave, that's going to be like way, way, way worse than wearing a smartwatch or wearing headphones all day. Um but again, that's just what I've read. I'm not I'm not an expert on the subject, so I, maybe someone else could explain it better. But that's just the rough understanding I have of it. Um, it. It would not be in the tech company's best interest to mass produce radioactive devices. You know, like even purely financially speaking, if all the companies cared about was money, then it's in their best interest for all of us to be alive, healthy, happy, so that we can keep buying more tech products. <laughs> Like, they have no motivation to mass-produce radioactive devices that give us cancer and stuff. Um, we'll know in 20 to 30 years if the radiation is a problem. Well, we already kind of know that the sun is a is a cause of that, so I don't think it's going to be a bigger problem than that. Um, I sleep with my AirPods in every night, and I can, can't, I can confirm I've become the Hulk. <laughs> That's a good one, Simply Sword. Thank you. Um... Let's see, the iPhone 15 Pro Blue Titanium is close to the 12 Pro Pacific Blue. I agree with you, but I've never done a side-by-side. -side. Let's see what the compare page looks like. So we get Blue Titanium, 12 Pro Max, Pacific Blue. Eh, they're close-ish, yeah, but I think the Pacific Blue has a little bit more of a green tint to it. But yeah, they're, you're right. They are very similar. That was the first thing I th thought when I saw the blue titanium. I was like, oh, it's the return of Pacific Blue. I actually like how different the colors are on the website. You get a really good idea of it. Um, why do you think people are talking about the weight of Apple's VR headset? That's, why not? I mean, the weight is a very important uh, factor on how long you can wear it, how comfortable is it. Um, if it's uncomfortable to wear, that might affect the desirability of the product. If you spent $3,500 on a headset and then after, you know, 20, 30 minutes, your neck is starting to get sore, then that might not be, that might not be worth it. Um, let's see. Thank you. Yes, you're right. Realistically, it can't hurt much, but for the, for some reason, I just can't let it go. I personally think you're worried about the wrong things, whatever device you're typing that on. If you're watching this live stream right now, that that device has probably the same level or close to the same level of radioactivity as a as a watch does. But um the bigger thing that I would recommend that a lot of people don't see the value in is sunscreen. Sunscreen um can substantially extend uh like skin health and for I've seen a lot of research saying just like, you know, how how well you age, just making sure your skin is protected from the sun, which is by far the most damaging thing to our bodies 
um, in terms of radiation and gamma, gamma rays and that kind of thing. So um, I've, I've seen documentaries talk about like uh, the creation of sunscreen having direct ties to how much longer people can live or how much younger people look in today's culture versus a few decades ago where sunscreen was not as common or um, not as many people wore it. So people would just burn more often and that creates problems. Um, so I would, I, I think, uh, it's okay to be worried about radioactivity and health and all that stuff. I just think you're, you're tackling the wrong problem. You shouldn't be tackling smartwatches and headphones. You should be, be more concerned about how much time you spend in direct sunlight and putting on more sunscreen and skin protection. Um, so that's, that's more worth your time or your thought process. Not so much the Bluetooth signals. I mean, if you're going to be worried about radio waves bouncing around, there's radio towers everywhere um, and cell towers everywhere. And whether or not you have a phone that receives that signal, the radio waves are still flying by. Um, sunscreen that gets on the car and couch and everything else you touch. How do you combat this issue, Drew? <laughs> yes, I agree. Sunscreen's annoying. That's why I didn't wear it a lot when I was a kid. But as I got older and realized all the problems it was causing by me getting burned and uh, now I got these moles and my dermatologist has to check up on me more frequently. Now it's like, it, just put up with the annoyance of sunscreen. It's so much easier and so much cheaper than having to deal with skin cancer of some kind. And for the record, skin cancer is not like, it's usually not a death threat. It's it's a very treatable form of cancer. Um, ultraviolet is ionizing radiation. Infrared and lower, including microwaves are not. Also radiation is used for several things. Phones aren't radioactive, which is not which is what radiation usually means. Thank you, Quentin. I think you know more about this than I do, but that sounded smart, so I'm going to believe it. <laughs> Consumer Compute says, I worry about my watch tan. I take the watch off. It's bright enough to be mistaken as ground staff at an airport. Okay, sorry. I think I limit myself to do <laughs> dad jokes the street. Thank you, Consumer. Um it's raining pretty much 90% of the time where I live. Yeah, there's still there's still uh, sun damage that can come through clouds just from daytime. It doesn't have to be, you know, direct sunlight. Um, we seem to think because it's not over 30 C, the sun is not dangerous. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I was trying to explain. <laughs> the sun can still be dangerous even when it's overcast. I'm saying this as a reminder to you, but it's also something I forget about because a lot of the time I'm like, oh, I don't want to deal with sunscreen. I just want to get out there and have fun or I just want to be here or whatever. Um, but it's seriously, it, it causes more, way more problems than I think a smartwatch is going to cause. Um, crispy joking tuna says I work outside and although I don't put on sunscreen, I wear long sleeves, skin health be important. That's another good solution. I used to go swimming all the time with my shirt off, but I would get a lot more sunburns that way, which increases the likelihood of getting skin cancer. Um, which is why now when I go swimming, I wear a long sleeve swim shirt, which is a blessing to those around me, <laughs> as well as a good sun protection. True wireless charging is my dream. Let's ignore kids. <laughs> I don't care if I die. I just want my phone to charge from across the room. That's the spirit. Um, do you think that USB-C will reign supreme? I think it will stick around longer than lightning, personally. Um, just because there's so much overhead with Type-C, there wasn't that much overhead with Lightning. Lightning was pretty good at getting up to about 30 watts, and it was good at being reversible, but it was not good at being bilateral. Apple never tried to make Lightning bilateral. I think by design, it's probably not meant to be very bilateral. The closest thing you got to that was probably the iPad, Apple Pencil 1, but... Um, <sighs> Sorry, I get angry whenever I see Final Cut on the iPad. I'm like, we asked for that for so long, and they gave us such a watered-down toy version of Final Cut, and they charge five bucks a month for it. And remember when people are like, oh, well, now that Final Cut's a membership, it'll get more updates, it'll get better faster over time. And I'm like, nope, it did not get better. Um, they didn't fix really any of the problems I complained about. Bilateral means it's the same port on either end. So, like, here's a good example. Um, if you have a USB-C port for whether it's power or data, like here's a little Samsung SSD. I record my videos to this. You have Type-C on one end and you have Type-C on the other end. So it doesn't matter which way you plug it in. It's like reversible, 
but now for the cable. So the nice thing about Lightning was that you could plug it in this way, or you could twist it around and plug it in this way, whereas 30 pin had to be plugged in one specific way. The downside of Lightning is you don't have Lightning to Lightning cables. One end goes Lightning, and then the other end you still have USB-A or USB-C, um, whereas with Type-C, it doesn't. you don't have to let, wait, which end of the cable do I plug in? You can just grab the cable, and you can plug this end first, or you can plug this end first. It's the same port, same shape on either side, which just makes it that much easier to plug in. You don't have to check and see which one. Am I. That still happens all the time um, in our household and in my family's households. I see where they grab the USB-C to Lightning cable, and they try to plug the Lightning cable into the brick, and then try to, and they're like, oh, that doesn't work. Hold on, let me flip it over. It's this end of the cable has to plug into this side. Um, I don't think Lightning was designed to be bilateral, so I don't, I don't think it had even the capability, really. They never made any, but I'm guessing there was a reason for it. But Type-C, there's so much overhead for, like, um, when it came to the new USB-C cables they dropped, um, now that they adopted Type-C. They're even advertising it now. Look at this. 240 watts and yet the iphone peaks out at like 20 watts basically maybe a little bit more than 20 watts um which means okay this is the first generation iphone with type c but we still could go like over 10 times faster power transfer speeds um with the exact same port with the exact same connector using cables that are being sold today you could buy a $30 cable right now that could still sustain 10 times the charging speed of whatever iPhone we have in 2030 or 2033. You know, 10 years from now, if the iPhone supports 240 watt charging, this cable will still support that. They're probably, you'll need a new charge brick, but the cable will still work. Um, so that's that gives me like a lot of hope for the future of like, okay, there's a lot of room for improvement. They can keep the USB-C port for a very, very long time and still make good use of it. Um, and now I think USB-C will probably stick around a lot longer also because of the federal mandates from many different countries and organizations, both Brazil, India, European Union, all have these deadlines on when tech companies need to switch over to type C on certain electronics. Most of that includes smartphones, of course. So I feel like it's going to be a lot harder to come up with a, a feature. Uh, what the real debate is, is how are you going to come up with a feature that needs a different port? How What feature can you think of for the iPhone that USB-C won't be able to handle? Like how much data do you need to transfer through that port? Because we know Thunderbolt 5 can sustain like 80 gigabits per second. And the read and write speed of our iPhones is nowhere near that. Um, we are nowhere close to touching 80, gig 80 gigabits per second, but Intel just announced Thunderbolt 5, which is capable of sustaining 80 gigabits per second, and it's still the exact same connector. It looks just like this one. It's just all internal upgrades. So that means that the overhead here for the iPhones with Type-C means we could go up to 240 watt charging and 80 gigabits per second and still be using the same connector. That was not really the case with Lightning. Lightning did not have that much overhead. Lightning allowed us to do like uh, 30 watts at the high end. And it started with 5 watts with the iPhone 5. It was like, okay, it can charge at 5 watts. And now with newer improvements, we can charge up to 20 watts or 30 watts. So it's like a a five at not even five right five to 20 five to 30 so a six x improvement from inception to end of life introduced with five watts peaked at about 30 watts with type c they're introducing it with 20 watts but we already from day one know that it's possible to sustain 12 times that with the same port design um evan says apple should have done more with USB C on the iphone 15s I think they probably could have, and they are just literally giving themselves room for improvement because they're kind of running out of things to add each year anyway. So they're like, we gotta, we gotta give something for net. We gotta save some things for later. You know, there's gotta be certain things that we just don't give it all away all at once. But I agree with you that they could have done more. Um, that'd be a huge charging. Qi 2 will be interesting. I wonder if the iPhone 15 series will support the full 15 watts on the Qi 2 standard without being MagSafe certified. Dad only mentioned it in passing during the keynote. Yeah, I would assume so. I don't see why they couldn't. 
Um, I think USB-C is the new headphone jack. It'll stay for 100 years because it's superior and nothing can be added to improve it. I know a lot of people probably disagree with you e-uploads, but I, I actually agree with you a lot. I think that the only jump you can really make that's reasonable or that's not reasonable, but worth entertaining is portless. Usually the argument against USB-C isn't, is USB-C good and, you know, HDMI better or is DisplayPort better? Usually the debate is, do we need a port? And if you're going to have a port, Type-C is the best port, especially for a smartphone because it has to be thin, um, portable, you know, it can fit on a fairly small device, but can still do a lot of power and a lot of data. That's how, you know, like your MacBook can still charge off of the same connector. Um, but what are we going to do? how are we going to come up with something that beats that in terms of power transfer, data transfer? We probably won't. I don't even think 240 watts is actually the limit. You know, with with more engineering and more uh, throughput, we could probably figure out how to surpass 300 watts. But again, Apple doesn't seem that keen on fast charging. The limiting factor preventing iPhone fast charging has probably got more to do with the battery and the power management system than it does the connector and the cables. I don't think that's a huge issue. Um, so the debate will be, do we need ports anymore? That's what we'll be fighting Type-C. But the reason I think that's not going to be a great argument is because having that tiny little connector here at the bottom really doesn't take up that much space in the phone. I know I understand that they're cramming a lot of stuff in here, but the phones have so much stuff in them already. It's not like removing the charge port is going to bring inherently that many advantages. It's like, okay, the battery might get like 3% bigger, or I don't know, the camera might have some more room because they can push more of the silicon down. But it's now that there's governments enforcing the charge port to be a certain standard on all devices, and it solves so many problems when you want to factory reset something or transfer large amount of files off the phone. And I honestly think that having type C and being able to improve on the charging speed and the data transfer speed, that's a very easy thing to upsell people on. That's a big marketing tactic. Apple can boast about how, Hey, this, uh, I mean, they are right now on this part of the page. It lets you connect your Mac and iPad with the same cable and you can charge other devices with your iPhone now because USB-C is bilateral, right? So, there's all these uh, advantages to having a port, and in my opinion, not very many advantages to uh, dis uh, disadvantages to keeping it. Um, they're still just as water resistant, by the way. That was a concern people had. USB-C means the iPhone won't be as water resistant. It's the exact same IP rating as before. Um, so it's not a problem with water and dust resistance. Obviously, Android phones were doing it for years. Um, so... There's just a lot more things you can sell people on, I feel like. Like, hey, you should get this phone because it has the faster port or there's faster charging now. Whereas if you get rid of that port, there's really just a bunch of disadvantages for maybe a couple like, oh, the battery's a little better now. And that's it. Um, USB-C ultra wide. Imagine the 30 pin connector, but with wide C. <laughs> that would be beautiful. I don't think it would be 30 pin though at that point. Um, let's see. Remember that the iPhones first came with the bigger 10 watt charging brick for a few years. Then they switched to five watt charging before the 18 watt in 2019. I don't remember that, but I believe you. Uh, what do I think of the new black magic camera app for iPhone? I did not see that, but I want to play around with that. That sounds fun. Um, can they just bring Thunderbolt to everything? <laughs> you probably wouldn't want them to because Thunderbolt is not free to incorporate. It would probably make the phone much more expensive and with the current software suite, there is literally no advantage to having Thunderbolt. Um, just for the sake of the example, if they would have not touched iOS, but just let's say they included Thunderbolt in the 15 Pros, you wouldn't be able to do anything differently because the limiting factor with the file transfer speeds is the read and write speed, not the, not the port, not the cable. It surprised me that they brought the matte glass on the standard 15s. Yeah, that was a that was a welcome surprise. I think it was rumored, but I had a harder time believing it. But the fact that it actually happened, I was grateful for because I love that frosted glass feel. iPhone 15 felt great. They should make white AirPods Max. Well, they have silver. Is that not good enough? It is good enough, but Lightning is not, which is why no one wants to buy AirPods Max, including me. <laughs> um. 
Micro USB was extremely horrible. I remember when one of those tech reviewers said there's a special place in hell for those people who made micro USB. I know people don't agree with me, but I still think USB-A is worse because micro USB at least is not symmetrical, um, which means that you can look at it and know which way to plug it in. You just look at a micro USB cable and then you look at the port and go, oh yeah, it's got the little cutoffs on the edges so you plug it in that way. USB-C people still make this mistake every day, all the time. Where, because it's symmetrical, it's just a rectangle, they go, oh, I can plug it in this way, and then you can't. Because it's not it's not reversible, but it is symmetrical. In my opinion, that was a far worse design decision. Micro USB isn't great, yeah, but I, at least it's not symmetrical, so you don't make that mistake that everybody makes all the time with USB-A. Um, oh, I don't have the iMac Pro anymore. Uh, I don't think I would update to it just because my MacBook Pro is so good. I've been tempted at times to get an external monitor for my MacBook because I did get very used to having a bigger screen to make all my videos and do all my live streams on. And the 16-inch MacBook Pro for me is still very small. Like, the screen isn't that big for me. But um, the problem, the reason I have a hard time justifying it is because there's certain times of the year where we take big trips and I'm out of the country for months at a time and... I'm just not at home, and I know I'm not going to be able to pack that external monitor with me, so USB-A is not reversible. No, it only plugs in one way. That's the problem. It takes everyone three attempts, right? They plug it in, it doesn't work, so they try it the other way, and then it doesn't work, and they realize they had it right the first time. Yeah. <laughs> that happened a lot. 15 on action button shortcuts for any function to activate by tapping on the back of the phone with gestures... One or two taps, even with a case on. So three, two, one, tap functions. What are you talking about? Yeah, I have the the double tap actions on the back of my iPhone thing. But I feel like they go off accidentally way too much. I'm always accidentally triggering it. Um, action button is a cool idea, but I still think it should have been lower on the phone. I think they're keeping it where the ringer switch is so that people feel familiar with it and it doesn't feel like too big of a change. Um but for comfort for comfort wise i think it would make more sense to put lower on the phone i hate that this doesn't fill the whole screen i'm not zoomed out and yet you can't see the entire phone um but yeah in a future generation i wouldn't be surprised if they move the action button lower because this is just a little awkward to reach for as people are using it more and more for different things um let's see if the iPhone 15 had USB 3 and 120 hertz, the tech community would have significantly harder time finding criticism for it. I don't think so. I think they probably would have complained about something else. Then it would be, oh, why don't they give the telephoto lens to the regulars? And we'd say, well, that's that's fine. It can just use a pinch on the main sensor because it's huge. And they go, no, no, it should get that too. That's how I feel about ProMotion. Is it's like that's so clearly a tech specy thing. That's why you put it on the Pro iPhone because an everyday person's not going to care about that kind of thing. And then everyone gets all angry that it's not a standard feature. Maybe because Android phones have it, but Android phones aren't doing LTPO on the cheaper models. They're usually doing locked at 120 hertz. So if Apple would have done non LTPO locked at 120 hertz on the fifth on the regular iPhone 15, the battery life would have gotten worse. Then everyone would have complained that the battery was worse. I think they just like to complain about things that they don't buy. People love complaining about things that aren't for them. That's kind of my whole career. Is people com <laughs> Dealing with people who complain about Apple products that they don't like because they don't work well for them. It doesn't matter if it works well for someone else. That's not important. All that matters is it doesn't work well for me and therefore it's a bad product and I need to convince other people that it's a bad product. So that I feel more vindicated in my own purchase decisions. I set my action button to change my focus to sleep. I still swipe down and activate it the old way. Muscle memory. Yeah. That's how I am with watchOS 10. I still want to swipe up to activate control center. But I all I get is those stupid widgets. Um, yeah, I agree. The 60 hertz on the iPhone 15 still looks way better than a lot of uh, cheap, clunky Android 120 hertz. Most people in the tech community are more passionate about 120 hertz than telephoto lens. Well, yeah, just because that's the that's the thing now. That's the thing that the Android uh, market has all moved away from 60 hertz, and Apple hasn't because they know that there's more to 
a software experience than the display itself. What matters far more than the display is what's on it. How responsive is that display? How smart is the software designed? How elegant is the user interface? Apple knows that matters a lot more than how many frames are we pushing per second. Why did they update AirPods Pro with USB-C but not AirPods Max? Great question, Buck. I don't know. I'm still wondering myself, like, so Apple decides when they come up with a new chip for the Apple Watch that it makes sense to put that on the Ultra and the regular Series 9. But then they don't put Type-C on AirPods Max, which are in desperate need of it, in my opinion, even if they did a tiny little refresh where there's no new silicon and no new case and anything. They just put Type-C on it. In my opinion, that would make the product so much better because I just don't want to spend $600 on a pair of headphones that exclusively charge via lightning. That's the crazy thing. AirPods Pro, you can charge with USB-C. You can charge with the Apple Watch charge puck. You can charge it with MagSafe. You can charge it with any old Qi wireless charger. But AirPods Max still are stuck lightning only. That's the only way to charge them. And they cost more than double the price. Which sucks because I love these headphones. I hate them and I love them simultaneously. Like, they were so comfortable when I put them on. I love the way they felt. I love the way they sounded. I love the digital crown approach. I, I never liked headphones with the touch pad controls. I could never get comfortable with those. And I always activated them accidentally. No, I agree. I I think everything should have been USB-C from 2017 onward. The only reason in my older videos where I was kind of putting up with Lightning was because I believed Apple was about to go portless. And then when 2020 came around and they still weren't portless, I was like, okay, never mind. If you're going to keep a port for this long, it should be Type-C. Honestly, they probably should have switched to Type-C with the iPhone 10 because they, they were already shipping a lot of hardware with USB-C at that point. And the iPhone 10 was already a big design change. There was already so many new things going on all at once um, that if people had to switch to Type-C, it would have, wouldn't have been that big a stretch because people would have been getting used to Face ID, getting used to gesture control, and getting used to wireless charging anyway. So there would have been so many new things to digest all at the same time. I would have said, yeah, just switch to Type-C. That's when they should have done it. My copium is that AirPods Max 2 will have H3 chips and lossless with iPhone. Ooh, that would make a lot of sense. I do think it's weird that they figured out a way to do lossless over the air, and yet they only let you do it on Vision Pro. That's really bizarre to me. So I feel like that's got to be coming to the iPhone. And maybe just because of lack of time or something, they they weren't able to get it ready in time for the iPhone 15. But maybe the iPhone 16 will get a dedicated, you know, H2 or H3 chip, and then they could do lossless playback from the phone to a pair of AirPods. That would be cool. I would have preferred the iPhone switch to USB-C on the iPhone 7 when they ditched the headphone jack. Heck yeah. The sooner the better. It was still pretty new at the time. Not that many people had USB-C accessories and stuff, but yeah. Now that we know it's the future, obviously in hindsight, it's easy to say, well, that was the right way to go. Uh, I've been watching you since middle school. You mentioning you thought Apple was going to go portless, just unlocked memories. Well, everybody did. Uh, Mark Gurman thought that. Mark has thought that not too long ago, earlier this year. MKBHD was saying, you know, the EU wants Apple to go USB-C, but I think they're going to go portless and bypass the law. And I, I was trying to explain to everybody that's not how the law works. And then there were other channels that were trying to say that, oh, Qi 2 is a different charging standard, so that way Apple doesn't have to accommodate for USB-C. And I was like, have you guys read the bill? That's not how it works. The bill says the device has to have USB-C. It doesn't say it has to have some kind of charging standard. Drew, what's lossless actually mean? Would hearing the difference be noticeable? I'm not going to be great at explaining it, but basically when you listen to music you're listening to a bunch of tiny little, like, look at, think of it as an audio version of pixels. You know, when you look at a screen, there's thousands or sometimes millions of little pixels that are all working together to create an image. With audio, there's a bunch of little sounds that are all being played together very quickly. And when they're played together, like a typical Apple Music, like non-lossless, if you're just listening to regular music on YouTube or Apple Music or uh, Spotify or whatever, it's typically around 326 kilobits per second. So it's like 326 little individual sounds that are all played within the span of a second. 
and you get a certain amount of detail about that. So lossless audio is kind of similar. It's not exactly, I know that's more complicated than this, but lossless is kind of like the audio version of maybe 4K or HDR or like is for video. It's higher resolution. So when you get lossless playback, you're talking more like thousands of kilobits per second. That's when you start... Some uh, FLAC files even support like 4,000, 5,000 kilobits per second. So you're getting, you know, four to 5,000 individual little sounds that are all being played within the span of a second. And um, lossless playback enables basically richer audio quality. But yes, like you said, a lot of people can't tell the difference. I've tried it myself. I've put on studio grade headphones that use like the quarter inch jack instead of the 3.5 millimeter jack and uh, listen to high fidelity audio and yeah it sounds good but I'm, I'm not one of those people that like gets disgusted if i hear a non-lossless audio sound like if i if i just listen to everyone tells me youtube music has terrible sound quality and i've been exclusively using youtube music for the past what six ten months or something it's been a long time that i've just been using youtube music and i use it with my airpods i use it in the car and it sounds great. It's it's just high fidelity audio. So it's just richer in quality. Um, some people can can notice it more than others. We call them audiophiles, as in lovers of audio. Um, and they can kind of pick up on that richer audio uh, playback. I do not consider myself an audiophile, so that's why I'm not trying to say that I need lossless or I need lossless. I don't really notice much. I guess for me, music or audio playback is just kind of something you have on in the background. It's usually not something I'm just actively like, I just need to hear this. I got to hear this right now. And it's normally like I play music or I play a podcast when I'm in the middle of doing something else. So my brain is not going to be dwelling too much on how many kilobits per second is this file. I, I'm just listening to it while I do something else. Um, I've, I've gone back and forth. I tried Apple Music and then I tried YouTube Music and then I went back to Apple Music and then I went back to YouTube Music. I did not find the audio quality substantially different in my experience. Some people say it's super noticeable. I'm not one of those people. Sorry. Um, lossless is mathematically the same as uncompressed. Yeah, because typically when you record an audio, you record a song or uh, edit a song together and export it, it's compressed to be a smaller file so that you can stream it. And also typically with most of our AirPods now, um, they're optimized to play AAC, which is a compressed audio format, but it's still, in my opinion, is fairly high quality. And that's what AirPods are kind of designed to play back, which is you get a lower file size so that you can stream it wirelessly and still have low latency. And what Apple has been working on with AirPods Pro 2 and the Vision Pro is how do we improve wireless latency so that you can get so much data being sent in real time over the air that you could have a lossless signal being played back without using a cable or a port, which they claim to have figured out. But it, again, there's different there's different levels of lossless, actually. So I'm barely scratching the surface on the lossless topic because the version of lossless that uh, AirPods Pro 2 has is actually not like the top of the top lossless. <laughs> it's not like the best lossless you can get. Um it's a certain version of it. I'm trying to hear where they reference it. It's like 10 bit something. Um, where is down here, maybe? Latest firmware. No, okay. They don't have that. I think it's in the newsroom post. They talk about it, but still, you're, you're probably not going to get as low a latency or as high a quality if you just plug in directly with a cable and have analog plug in versus digital. Um, but yeah, I've been flipping through YouTube music and Spotify recently. And the only difference for me is YouTube music is louder. That's fine. I just don't have to click the volume as much. Um, unless you have a very expensive headphones or speakers, you're probably not going to notice much difference between 320 kilobit AAC and lossless, which is a great point. He uploads because that's why I think Apple is mentioning this. I think it's very bizarre marketing wise that they didn't talk about the new AirPods Pro supporting lossless. They just kind of included that in the newsroom post and they slightly updated the website saying like, well, actually we put in a a better silicon chip that allows for lossless playback when paired uh, with Apple Vision Pro. But that's awfully convenient, right? Because no one has an Apple Vision Pro. No one can test this feature. 
but they're bragging about it a little bit. So why not just not say anything? Why not say that the USB-C AirPods didn't change? Well, it's probably just one more thing to make people go, oh, so you're telling me the new AirPods Pro 2 have features that the old AirPods Pro 2 didn't have. And that just might be enough to push someone over the edge. They're like, oh, this, this new pair of AirPods is more future-proof. I get lossless playback. The truth is, with this design of headphone being so small and so efficient and has to be very um, aware of power consumption and it has to be optimized to play back AAC, which as far as we can tell, they didn't change much with the little tweeters or the woofers that they stuff in these tiny little pods. There's a good chance that, okay, you can technically play back lossless with this thing, but can you hear it? Is it actually that much different? My guess is probably not, which is why they're talking about it now, because we're not going to really remember the promises they made by the time the Apple Vision Pro came out. They have already sold 10 million AirPods Pro 2 by that point, so they already got their money. And you're past your return windows, right? So I feel like with something like AirPods Pro, lossless playback is not going to make a big difference. However, something like AirPods Max, which has a lot bigger tweeters, a lot more you know intricacy to the design that's probably going to be a lot better at outputting a lossless signal, which is maybe why they haven't updated them yet is because they're waiting until they can get that working properly. Um, and they might want to wait until the iPhone has a way to send that lossless signal. So I would hate that to be the case, but we might have to wait until iPhone 16 season before AirPods Max get lossless. Um, lossless feels a bit like 120 hertz discussions. Most people probably won't notice and care. No, Mo you're right. Most people won't notice or care, but, um, we're in the tech space now. Okay. So there's not much we can talk about that everyday consumers will notice or care. The only thing we can talk about that might affect everyday consumers in the tech world is pricing, I guess. How do the phones get cheaper? I don't know. Buy it secondhand. Um, I hope you can get Randy's review for AirPods Pro lossless. I don't know. That's going to be tricky because not only will he have to buy a new pair of headphones, he already has AirPods Pro 2. I doubt he's interested in buying another pair just because they have USB-C. Um, but on top of that, we also have to make sure Randy gets Vision Pro to test it. I don't know if he's going to do that. Thank you, AJ, for the 13 months of support. Is iPhone 13 form factor cheap enough for SE4? Probably. It's been in production for quite some time now maybe not right this second but maybe next year or the year after um usually that's what the iphone se becomes it's it's usually an older design that is still in production so the fact that they're not building any more mini iphones is a pretty good indication that the mini is not going to be the new se as much as we may want it um, if you live in the United States, there are a lot of excellent third-party free and open source apps that have free access to the YouTube Music API, Intertune, VMusic, Spotube. Interesting. I didn't know about that. Even Apple and Amazon and Tidal, they have plenty of files that are not lossless, and the vast majority of people are using Bluetooth, which doesn't support lossless anyway. Exactly. It's something that most people should probably not care about, but it'd be kind of cool if Apple kind of started standardizing lossless playback through the new H2 chip and that kind of thing. Cause then everyday people could actually hear lossless without using a wire um, and just notice it passively. But again, I, I bet most people will not notice the difference because it's fairly, it's fairly small. Okay. Uh, do I plan on getting an Apple vision pro 15 pro max and AirPods pro lossless to review and test all these things? I don't know why I need a 15 pro max to test all those. That doesn't involve <laughs> that doesn't involve the lossless. I don't know. Um, I definitely would like to try out an Apple Vision Pro, but I'm unsure how easy they're going to make that. There's talk that because they're so low in supply, um, they might be by appointment only, so it might not be as easy to order as an iPhone is. Um, and I also feel kind of bad if it is super low in inventory and it's very hard to get a hold of them. Should I buy one if I don't plan on keeping it? I really don't think I should keep it because it's so expensive. And also first generation hardware from Apple rarely ends up being very useful. It's usually just a proof of concept type thing. You know, when you, when you ask people what their favorite iPhone was, they never say the first gen. Most people didn't even believe the iPhone had a bright future until a few generations later, the three and the three GS and the four, that's when a lot more people started getting into iPhones. 
Um, the first generation iPhone was missing so much. It didn't have multitasking. It didn't have wallpapers. It didn't have um, an app store. You couldn't even enter jiggle mode and move the apps around. There was so many, like, you didn't have a front-facing camera. So if you just looked at the first generation iPhone and held it to say, hey, check this out. Most people were like, oh, yeah, that's ridiculous. It's way more expensive than any other smartphone on the market. And um, it's totally... It's totally unnecessary. It's not that different from just getting an iPod in a in a flip phone. Um, so why 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 would I buy that? That's ridiculous. It's not that good. And then a few generations later, once they iterate on it, they improve on it, and they kind of address the the biggest concerns. That's when more people start getting interested in it. And um, so I'm ex just for the record, even though I probably will not keep Apple Vision Pro. Spoiler alert. I don't I don't think it's a device that I'm going to be able to justify keeping. I'm still excited about it. I still think it's probably the most interesting thing going on at Apple right now. Everything else is just iteration. Um, I'm like, I'm like excited to see uh, what future Vision OS devices are going to unlock and be capable of. And I'm excited to see what developers come up with. And I'm excited to try it on because honestly, Tim Cook and all the media people like Marquez and Mr. Who's the Boss, who got to check out the Vision Pro headset in person. It feels like everybody who tried it in person was blown away by it and just totally amazed. They were just like, oh my God, this is the best mixed reality headset I've ever tried. It's so immersive. It's so cool. And the eye tracking is like telepathically good. Like it's just, everybody seems blown away by the hardware, which is why I'm excited, but is it a device that I could see myself using regularly and I could justify spending $3,500 on? No, probably not, but I'm still excited for it. I'm, I'm excited for the future generations of it that improve on it and hopefully get it more affordable. Um, but yeah, it, just think of how we look back at the first generation Apple Watch now or the first generation iPad or the first generation iPhone. They're always like interesting proof of concept, but it doesn't really sell you. You don't really commit to it until a few generations later. The Apple Watch really started taking off with the Series 3 and the Series 4. And then the iPad really started taking off after two or three generations in. iPhone, same story. So I'm more interested in Apple Vision Pro 3 or Apple Vision Pro 4. Like how good is it going to be by that point? Um, the first generation honestly it doesn't even really matter that much in my eyes because even if there was a ton of demand for it apple doesn't have the production capacity let's say for the sake of the example what if apple vision pro is a thousand dollars okay that's a lot more digestible maybe a lot more people could buy it if it was only one thousand instead of thirty five hundred okay great they still can't make that many they're still limiting it to just the united states um they did not even say it's coming outside the u.s at a later time they just said it's u.s only and um, the current projections from the supply chain analysts are saying that Apple's planning on building less than 400,000 units, which for Apple, that's very, very small. Most things Apple makes by the tens of million. You know, they sell tens of millions of AirPods, tens of millions of iPhones, and even tens of millions of iPads. We're talking tens of millions of these other products. With Vision Pro, they're talking like a couple hundred thousand, not even one million. So it's incredibly lower production capacity because they're using these state-of-the-art micro OLED panels that have really never been mass produced before. And they have these crazy new cameras, crazy new chips. There's all this state-of-the-art new tech inside it that's not loading. Thank you, T-Mobile. <laughs> Probably because I'm live streaming. Um, yeah, I'll let this page load, hopefully. Um, they took down the site. There's something. Can I see the hardware on the inside, please? Where'd it go? But this is what I was more interested in, was like, how, why does Apple want to enter the space? What do they want to do with the spatial computing space? And that I was a lot more excited by. I was like, okay, they're trying to figure out a way to make the last display you'll ever need, something that could fill the blur the lines between TV screen and phone screen and everything just starts to become like putting your virtual world on top of your real world. Um, it's not about uh, video games necessarily. There was surprisingly little video game discussion. Um, it's more just about like merging your software with your environments and 
making the interactions you have with computers more natural and intimate rather than reaching out and touching a screen. Now you can just look at something and tap your fingers together. Um, it's a very expensive proof of concept. Yes. But like, do, do people who kept their original Apple watch feel like they got a really great deal on it or they, they get a lot of value out of it. I don't know anybody actually that still has their original Apple watch. I haven't seen that comment in a long time. Um, and even that the original Apple watch was like 400 bucks. This is 3,500 bucks. And it will probably get substantially like way, way better with the second gen. Yeah, I'm I'm probably more interested in the second gen. Um, it's a very expensive proof of concept. It's almost, in my opinion, this is more of an exercise for Apple just to kind of prove to the world, okay, we know how to mass produce this thing because that's a very complicated chain of events that they have to prepare for. And then they have to, they don't really need to make it widespread. It feels like intentionally they're not trying to make this a widespread device because obviously $3,500 is absurdly expensive for any tech product. Very few people can justify $3,500 purchase of anything that's not a car. And um, Apple's more just like, we don't need to sell the product. We need to sell the idea. What we need to focus, we need to change the narrative right now from I don't need a spatial computing device to spatial computing devices are too expensive. Um, like it's right now, most people before this came out are probably not that interested in buying a headset. You know, that's what Apple's known for. They're not known for inventing new things, but they are known for mainstreaming technology that already exists. There's very few things that Apple really invented. All they really do is take what's already a thing and find a way to make it more approachable to the masses um, but with this generation, more of the focus is just on how do we convince someone that this is something they might want? It's not necessarily something they can afford yet. Let's just get people on board with the idea of, okay, here's a good, here's a good use for a, a headset. Here's something I would want in a headset. This is like super immersive, um, super good eye tracking, super user-friendly user, -friendly user uh, interface. Um, super easy to just put on and start using with the biometrics and, you know, tracking the hand motions and everything and really good subject detection, which they've learned a lot from, as you guys can already see from behind me, the Apple Silicon in this MacBook is doing a great job masking out my hand from the display that I'm capturing behind me. And that's making, uh, that's proving the power of what these neural cores can do. And that, you know, neural net training that they've gotten really, really good with their computers is going to play into how immersive the content is when you're wearing this headset, because you're going to be able to put a display up and still have things walk in front of it and behind it. And you're going to reach out and your hands are going to be pretty perfectly masked out so that it feels like it's really there. It's an immersive experience. Um, the second gen will give us a good idea of what Apple's vision for the, vi I feel like the first generation gave us a great idea of what, what the headset is for. Um, it's not a great idea of how to get a lot of people to buy it because it's U.S. only and stuff. Um, the Quest Pro headset is $1,000 in the new Quest 3, which has a mixed reality stuff, is 500 I know, but it's nothing close to what this thing can do. I mean, there's some overlap, but with those Quest headsets, you're talking about putting a mid-range Android phone chip on your face. This is a quote from The Verge. Apple Vision Pro is like putting a MacBook on your face because the people that all got to try it out in person were very aware of what the Meta Quests were capable of doing. And they still said that it's night and day difference. Having, you know, 4K TV per eye and stitching together all of those camera feeds and having hand tracking and eye tracking that good that's that responsive and having Vision OS... Um, the spatial audio is, yeah, there's just a bunch of things all coupled together that I think will make this experience far more immersive and make it feel far more real and magical than what a meta, but I do think meta will do well because of this. I think a lot of Apple people will probably be like, oh, Apple's entering this space, but it's too expensive. I'll try a cheaper one because meta, you see, it checks a lot of the same boxes. That's what Marquez said on the waveform podcast. He's like, people are going to compare the vision pro to the quest and say, see, they do a lot of the same things, but he's like, 
but the experience is totally different. Like if you just put one on and put on the other, it's going to be night and day. But if you just look at a checklist, yeah, the MetaQuest has pass through. Yes, it has eye tracking. Yes, it has hands tracking, but very different experience actually using them. Same thing with the iPhone versus Android stuff, right? Android can check a lot of boxes, but it's still an Android. And if it's not running iOS, the experience is going to be very different. Any idea when the Apple glasses are coming out? I don't think Apple knows when the Apple glasses are coming out. I read today something about Vision Pro supports up to 120 hertz, which was new to me. Apple didn't really talk about the refresh rate that much. Yeah, the R1 chip, I think that's another huge advantage Apple's got going for it. Um, it's close to your eyes, but your eyes are not focusing on something close to you. So it's the same thing as like, it's not bad for your eyes to be looking out of glasses, even though the glasses are really close. Do prescription glasses make your eyesight worse because you're looking at something that's technically only one inch away? No, the light is passing through it and your eyes are focused on something further away. Whereas this, it's a more complicated version of that. But yes, light is basically just passing through the cameras and then being restitched together with those micro OLED panels. I agree. You still need to get AirPods. I feel like if you're buying a $3,500 Apple headset, though, you probably already have AirPods. What kind of person wouldn't have AirPods but would buy this headset, you know? Yeah, I didn't hear them say 90 hertz, but I heard people say 90 uh, from interviews or discussions. But I saw, where's that headline? Um, yeah, this was Mac rumors just yesterday. According to the code in the latest beta of Vision OS. How do people have this? Oh, M1 asterisk, leaked code. Apple Vision Pro refresh rate revealed according to Vision OS Beta 4. They seem to be refresh rate modes of 100 hertz, 96 hertz, and 90 hertz. Adjusted to 100 hertz to compensate for detected 50 hertz flicker from artificial lighting. That's fascinating. I don't even think about that. There's so many things you have to compensate for if you're looking through cameras at your environment. Because if you have lights that flicker at 50 hertz um, that, you know, that are refreshing like that, then if you had 90 hertz, you would, you would get a little flicker when you're looking at them so they can switch to 100 to compensate for it. That's fascinating. I have a Quest 2, and I can see how super premium Apple version is going to be a game changer. There you go. I, I know a lot of people that bought Quest headsets that don't really use them much anymore. So far, all the footage we've seen is simulated. Most of what we saw was people using their Macs on their headsets, so there's a lot we don't know. I don't think it's going to be the kind of tech product that catches on as quickly as an iPhone or an iPad or even an Apple Watch because those things are so much easier to market. It's so much easier to just say, like, okay, you, you take it out of the box and there's a screen and you touch it, and people can grasp, okay, I get what that's like. This is something that you is really hard to market. You can't. You can't show people what it's like to experience this through a 2D screen because we're all reading about it and learning about it through looking at a MacBook display or an iPhone display. And we're just watching content through a 2D screen about how it's going to be and how responsive it's going to be. But from what I can tell, it feels like everybody that's tried it is really amazed by it, which is why I think people's perspective or opinion on whether or not they would want the headset or use the headset is going to come down to Try it out, use it for a little while, and then see if you could justify it. Um, kind of the same as a mirror, I guess, even though you can't look through a mirror at the same time you can. I don't really see how it's similar to a mirror, but yeah, your eyes your eyes are not focusing on the displays. You're, they're, they're focusing on, because the two displays in here are giving you two different perspectives. Um, whereas if you use your phone really close to your face like this, your eyes are both focusing on something that's really close to your face. Whereas if I if I was wearing the Vision Pro headset right now, I, my eyes would be focusing on the wall because it would probably be putting a display or a, a app or something on that wall. And it's giving me two different perspectives so that my eyes are being basically tricked into thinking, okay, there's a screen, there's an app right here. But I'm not actually focusing on something right here. You can't anyway. It doesn't work. Um, the focus point is the same for the wall as it is the display. I hope that's what you meant, Simon. <laughs> um, let's see. Not only they're kind of... Apple execs are talking something like the MP3 player and producing it at an unprecedented unpre scale. And this is kind of an unusual product for them. It's not just ready to go on announcement. Not only they are kind of getting people used to the idea 
a year early, but the first thing is going to have a pretty limited release, it sounds like. Yeah, probably one of the most limited releases of any uh, recent generation Apple product, honestly. Um, yeah, look at all these sensors that are tracking your eye motion. I'm really excited to try it. Anytime I watch interview, I wish we could talk more about it, honestly. I, I did a bunch of videos on Apple Vision Pro after the event, but they don't perform that well. People just want to talk about iPhones. They would rather talk about 120 hertz refresh rate on a $800 phone than they would talk about like rethinking the way we use computers, which is a bummer to me because it's like, I think people ask Apple to innovate. People ask Apple to try new things or do something different or enter a new segment. And I'm like, this is it. I've been asking for Apple to take risks or do something different, you know, to think outside the box a little bit and try to try to do something a little bit out of the ordinary. And they're finally doing it. And most of the tech community is like, yeah, but it's expensive. And I'm like, that's not that's not really the point, though. That's <laughs> the first generation price is not. It's just like, well, I'm not going to buy that. So I, can, I don't want to talk about it. It's like, OK, we might buy future generations of it, though. Um there's no way app for Apple to charge 3500 Oh, trust me. They're going to sell every single one, and you're going to hate it. Um, I do not hear developers talk about the Vision Pro on Twitter anymore. Well, there's probably not much to talk about. I mean, they talked about it when it first came out, but obviously it's iPhone season and Pixel season right now, so that's more interesting. But next spring, they'll probably have an event where they go over more details and more of the specs, and they let people order it, and... That's when I will try my best to get my hands on one and try to experience it. And I would honestly, I've got so many tests I would like to try. I, I would want to see if I get eye fatigue after extended use or neck fatigue or like how low the latency is with those displays. Like, could I, could I play tennis with this thing on? You know, all that kind of stuff would be interesting. Um, when do I think it'll come out? Well, according to Tim, it's still on track to launch... They said early next year, right? So, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know exactly what that means. I think there's a chance it could get pushed back a little bit more um, than they think, particularly the eyesight display. I think from day one, I still feel like that's that thing's the first to go. Um, that's got to be this whole thing is stupid. I the whole point of the eyesight display is to try to make it feel more natural, but it does anything but that. Like, it's unnatural to talk to someone by looking at their eyes through a screen, and it'll still be unnatural to talk to them without an eyesight display. It'll feel weird either way. All this is doing is adding an additional power consumption, it's lowering the battery life, and it's increasing the price, because apparently this has only been simulated. We haven't seen a real-world working demo of an eyesight display yet, because it's very complicated. It's supposed to provide a different viewpoint of your face depending on which way you're looking at it they've never made a curved lenticular display like that before um so it's very difficult to make and it's probably adding a lot to the overall cost of the headset um so like when you do this you see the the, the perspective of the eyes and stuff shifts as they turn their head and i'm just like dude we don't need to see the person's eyes they're wearing a headset that's fine like we don't see a person's eyes when they're wearing sunglasses. Like it's to me, the bigger problem is the bulkiness and the size, which with the first generation, they're always advertising people wearing it by themselves. They're not really around other people. They're just looking at these big tiles and screens and everything. And I'm just like, okay, if we're just going to be using it by ourselves, then why do we care so much about the eyesight display? You know, um, we should just focus on, can you mass produce it? But I think long term, I don't think uh, the eyesight display is going to stick around. I watch. I'm sure Apple was paying attention to the media and how people were reviewing the headset. And pretty much every YouTube channel I watched that covered it was saying that the eyesight display is probably unnecessary and they'll probably get rid of it. They'll they'll probably remove it on a cheaper model or they'll remove it on the next generation and. If Apple keeps hearing that from everybody and everybody keeps saying, that's weird, that's unnecessary, I don't want it to do that, like, take that part out and make it cheaper. If everybody keeps saying that, I bet Apple will do it because I think a lot of people are excited and interested in the concept of spatial computing and, you know, hand tracking and eye tracking and rethinking the way we use a computer and everything. And a lot of people might try it and be very impressed by it, but... 
they won't be as interested in, oh, do my eyes show up on the outside? I, I don't think so. Will the eyesight display matter if the device gets smaller? I don't think so. I think if you if you compact it down to make it look more, I don't think glasses will ever make sense personally because you just have so much less battery life to work with and glasses are just a really hard thing to get right in terms of like portableness and, and size and you can't cover someone's peripheral vision as well with glasses. So I think like something more in line with ski goggles, you know, like where, where's a good picture of one? Black ski googles <laughs> yes something like this yeah yeah as we get closer and closer to it being more practical i think you could you could make it a little bit more stylish and then you could see you know there's people wearing them kind of <laughs> casually like that they're the hottest look in fashion see apple has a way of making fashion trends like they Everybody critiqued AirPods and said AirPods look stupid. And then after a while, we got used to them. But um, the ski goggles and just looking at a display that is reinterpreting uh, camera feeds from the outside, I think that's always going to be simpler and cheaper and give you a lot more real estate for cooling systems and silicon and all that. Um, wish Google would actually be confident in its products instead of killing it as soon as they feel like it's not a smash hit. Yeah, I do too, but at least they're keeping the pixels going. Um, Google Glass was ahead of its line. I don't even think Google Glass was similar to this at all. Google Glass just put a little widget in the top of your vision. It wasn't really spatial computing. Um, skiing with Apple Vision Pro, that might be fun. The AirPods Max prepared our necks for Vision Pro. <laughs> Ironically, for a community who are supposedly interested in future tech, they are remarkably stuck with being interested in old, well-established tech. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's exactly how I feel, Martin Gell. Thank you. Techies wanted Apple to make foldables. Yeah. <laughs> no, this isn't innovative. This isn't different. I just want you to make a better iPhone. And then when you make a better iPhone, I'm going to complain that it could have been even better. Or, um. Let's see. Do you trust Google will keep their promise of seven years of OS support for the Pixel 8? Maybe I'm wrong, but I think they will. I, I I know Google cancels services and stuff a lot, but they usually don't put a timeline on it. Usually Google like announces a service, but they don't really say how long it's going to be around. And then if it doesn't work out, then they just kill it off. I, I haven't seen them that often like announce seven years of support or seven years of updates and then like five years in kill it off or something. I haven't seen that where they just straight up lied on stage. Um, at least with definitive timelines, I guess there was a time I remember back in 2015 or 2014 when they announced Google photos, they said it's going to be unlimited picture and video storage for everybody. iOS on Android. They didn't give a specific timeline on it, but they just did say it's free for everyone today. Um, and then years down the road, they ended up saying, oh, this isn't a good idea. We can't hold everyone's pictures. So then they changed the rules. But um, it would have been different if they were like, well, they did something about Pixel Pass. Everyone wants to talk about Pixel Pass. Um, Pixel Pass, I don't recall them giving a specific timeline on. Um, Google kills Pixel Pass. They just said, like, this is an option. Um, someone was tweeting that they were reaching out to people. These are all the old headlines. Um, as of today, interest fee financing. My guess is just not that many people used it. That's my prediction. But I can't find the article. Maybe it was a tweet. Someone was explaining they were apologizing for pixel pass or they were refunding people or something um but again that's that's like a one-year thing so <laughs> they didn't say pixel pass will be available for the next five years and then kill it in three years they just said here's a new service and then i'm guessing not that many people were using it so they killed it and yes they killed it way too fast and I, i'm not saying they were right to kill it but um when they're committing to software updates in a specific timeline, I feel like they're more likely to honor it. Um, 
but it's if it's interest free financing, then I guess people did take advantage of it. I love hearing Drew talk trash about the Google things. They got to do something trashy. I guess Pixel Pass was pretty trashy, but I'm guessing I I don't recommend you finance phones, so <laughs> I'm kind of glad that they're killing it off. Because I've really okay. If you can't pay for the phone outright, you probably shouldn't be buying a phone like that. You know, if you if you don't have that much cash on hand, probably don't buy a one thousand dollar phone. Um, especially if you're buying a Pixel, you can find them for so much cheaper secondhand. Pixels have horrible resale value, which means that they get super super cheap just like a year after they come out. So, if I were you guys, I would not be doing Pixel Pass stuff. It was wrong of Google to offer it and then kill it off that quick, but um, I just have a hard time getting angry because I'm like, eh, people shouldn't be financing phones. I've, I've never recommended that. Um, no, of course I don't have 12 terabytes of iCloud. What would I even put on there? I could back up my entire MacBook on iCloud and I'd still have several terabytes left over. Um, people are on 36 month installments now. I know that's crazy. That's just silly to me. Highly discourage that behavior because it encourages everybody to uh, spend more than they have. Um, it was about paying so that you can get a free phone in two years. A free phone in two years. They probably, I got to do more research on it, but yeah. I'm not trying to defend Google here. I'm just saying just because they killed this thing off prematurely doesn't necessarily mean that their claim to get seven years of support is wrong. And they're putting the, I mean, honestly, if they didn't plan on offering seven years of support, they shouldn't make that promise, right? That would make them look bad. So they are, they are, even if they don't honor the seven years of support claim, they are basically opening the door and welcoming open criticism because if they don't, uphold that rule with the pixel eight, then we can all point to, Hey, remember when you promised seven years, you were wrong on that. And like, they're welcoming that criticism that they can't be trusted. That's why they put it on the record. Here's what we're offering. Here's what we're promising. Um, pixel seven pro costs the same as an iPhone SE at the moment here, buying them at full price is not a good deal. I agree. That's even if I really wanted to switch to Android and I wanted to buy a pixel eight pro, I probably would not buy it at launch. I'd probably wait just a couple months and then you could probably find it for half price. Why is paying with installments bad? As long as you're responsible, I think it's fine, especially for emergency purchases, purchases like a new oven or something. I just think it points to a bigger problem. Like if you don't have, first of all, a phone, in my opinion, especially a, a brand new phone or a high end phone like this is a total want, not very much a need. Um, and if you don't even have like a thousand dollars to spare in your bank account, um, I don't think you should be <laughs> trying to buy a $1,000 phone. You should probably try to get, if you don't have a spare grand in your bank account, I don't think you should probably buy a $200 phone or just make use of the phone you have just because I feel like it's irresponsible to spend that much of your like net worth on a phone. <laughs> it's like as someone who's bought and reviewed a lot of phones, they're not worth it. Like, Maybe it makes sense. In my opinion, it makes sense to get into debt on things that appreciate with time, like a house, um, because over time the house will get more valuable. But with a phone like this, it's going to instantly lose a ton of its value the second you unbox it. Yeah, Dave Ramsey style. I still like credit cards. I think there's a responsible way to use them as long as you pay them off every month. But um, that's because there's rewards and they help you build credit with uh with a credit card, they can help build your credit score. And then when you do a more big loan or, you know, buy a house, they look at your credit history. And then if you have been paying off your credit card reliably and not carrying a balance, then you have a higher score and they'll give you a better interest rate on that home loan. So I can understand the, the benefit of a credit card there with, you know, cash back and rewards and stuff, as long as you're responsible with it. With the financing of a phone, there's usually not some kind of incentive with that. It's not like you get cash back with that. It's not like you get credit history improvement through that. It's just, it supports the idea that, okay, you don't need to have the money for this thing. You can have the thing now and you'll just pay for it monthly because you start doing that with a phone and then you might do it with a bike and then you do it with a car. And then before you know it, 
you're surrounded by stuff you don't actually own. And then if something happens, there are emergencies. People could lose their jobs or unexpected expenses can come up from, you know, accidents or health issues or things pop up. And then all of a sudden now you have all of this stuff that you can't afford to pay for anymore. Um, whereas if you just buy things outright, okay, an emergency situation could come up and that's okay. You're not going to lose your car, lose your phone, lose your stuff because you didn't pay them off. Um, it's just dangerous and it's a very big problem in our country. Lots of people are financing more and more things and living more month to month and just thinking, oh, well, next paycheck will cover it. I'll be fine. And it's a slippery slope that's not worth the convenience, in my opinion. The convenience of, oh, I don't have to withdraw $1,000 from my bank account. It's like if if that $1,000 is that valuable to you, then you should not be getting a phone that expensive, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, because it, it supports a lifestyle that gets a lot of people in a ton of trouble. Consumer debt is a massive problem in our country right now. So that's why I'm just like, yeah, I mean, companies, of course, they just want to move inventory. They just want your data and they just want to know that you're on their stuff, paying for their stuff. Um, so they, they don't really care how you pay for it. And they could probably charge you interest if you start missing payments on it. Whereas if you just buy it once outright, they can't charge you interest on that later on. So they're they're far more incentivized to get you into debt. They're far more incentivized to um, get you on some kind of financing program or even with a Pixel Pass program. It's getting people on the idea that, oh, you we upgrade every year. That's normal. That's That's what Apple's doing with the iPhone upgrade program, right? It means that I no longer have to convince you that the new iPhone is worth it. I just have to say, this is how much it costs to have the latest iPhone. And I just pay you on it because the companies get more money out of people when they break it down into smaller increments. Don't think of it as a $1,000 purchase, because obviously if you try to convince someone that a titanium iPhone is worth $1,000, that's a lot of money. That's a hard thing. That's a hard pill to swallow. But if you just tell them, no, no, actually it's only, uh, look at that. It's only 41 bucks a month. You can afford that. I mean, oh, your Wi-Fi, your electricity, that's way more than 40 bucks a month. You use your phone a lot, right? Actually, if you take it down from the month, it's really only like a dollar or two a day. It's like two bucks a day to have the latest iPhone. Yeah. Okay. You, how much do you spend on coffee and groceries? Yeah. Let's just look at the smallest possible number. Um, yeah, big businesses absolutely rely on debt. So the more debt they can get you in, the more the, the, the mindset of, oh, don't think about if upgrading is worth it. Just upgrade every year regardless. And we'll give you financing options. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll just keep you paying that $41 a month. Um, as long as they've got that consistent income coming in, um, they're doing their job. So I, I just think it's totally to the business's advantage and it's capitalizing on the impatience of customers, which is why I'm, I'm doing my best to combat that with my line of work and just being like, your old phone is okay, don't upgrade just because of a new feature that you're not actually going to utilize all that much, you know. So that's why I tend to not recommend financing on really any tech purchase. I, I don't think it I don't think it's justified. Um, installments by itself is not a bad thing. The problem are the plans that are typically required for installment plans. I don't I just don't think they're inherently a good thing because what what are you trying to say that the whole reason there's an installment thing an installment plan is the concept that you either don't have or don't want to spend a certain amount of money right now but you want that item now so the the whole concept of an installment plan comes from the concept of impatience I don't want to wait I need this thing now even if I don't necessarily have all the money ready for it and the more we encourage that buying behavior the more trouble people find themselves getting in. So that's why I'm like, what, why are you trying to complicate this? Don't, don't train your brain to work that way. Don't like, you should train your brain what the total cost of the item is, not what the monthly cost of the item is, because if you focus on the monthly cost, you'll spend a lot more. Anyway. Um, I've wondered why no one has sued Google yet. Pixel packs was canceled before anyone got a new pixel. So they scammed people. I got to find that tweet. Someone was saying that they were doing something about it. I don't think they were necessarily scamming people. They just didn't uphold the deal. Um, let's see what people are saying. Um, no one got their free upgrade before. Maybe it was Trenton's tech. Pixel Pass. They are making work right with current users. I think I saw Jason's tweet on this. Um... They can keep using the service until the two years is up and they get an extra $100 towards upgrading to a new Pixel anytime in the next two years. 
Um, Google cancels products more than we all like, but they always do what they can to support. Yeah, they refunded everybody who bought games on Stadia, by the way. So I know they killed it, but... Um, kind of easy to believe that Google would not honor a free upgrade to those who are on the plan. What happens on my current Pixel Pass subscription? Can I continue using the product after it's discontinued? Your current Pixel Pass subscription is not affected. You may continue to use its services for two years from the date of the subscription. Can I still upgrade my Pixel device after 24 months? Yes, you can still upgrade your Pixel device after 24 months. You just won't be able to renew your subscription to Pixel Pass. You can purchase or finance your next Pixel directly from Google Store or Google Fi. You have the option to trade in your current Pixel device towards your next device. Current Pixel subscribers, Pixel Pass subscribers received $100 towards their next Pixel purchase. Good for two years, which can be used alongside promotions. Um, so from what I've gathered, it wasn't they they weren't getting as screwed over as originally thought. Um, sure, it maybe wasn't as great as people were hoping, but I don't think they just scammed people. Like they didn't all have to turn in their phones afterwards. Um, <laughs> but they. They took people's money for a product and a service that they provided to them. They're just, they're basically, as far as I understand it, they're they are not taking new Pixel Pass members, but existing Pixel Pass members are getting what they were promised. In the short term, at least. But they're getting credit towards the next thing, and they can still, can I still upgrade my Pixel device after 24 months? Yes. So, I don't see that as a scam, personally. <laughs> It's like, that's what they said it would do. They're just not really letting more people take advantage of it. Um, would I make, recommend upgrading from the 13 Pro to a 15 Pro Max? No, not really. <laughs> I've answered, I've given the long answer to that question so many times that I'm just going to give people short answers now because I feel like people don't listen to what I say when I give the long answer, so I'll just give the short one. 13 Pro is a great phone. You'll be fine. Hasael says, will the 6.3 inch 16 Pro be the same size in the hand as a 7 Plus? Uh, good question. I don't know. I bet the bezels will still be pretty thin. Google doesn't have two horns, just one. <laughs> yeah. 7 Plus. Might be a little bit bigger than the. Yeah. Huh. It's a little bit bigger than a 15 Pro, 6.3 instead of 6.1. I think it might be a little bit smaller than a 7 Plus, but yeah, I would say the 16 Pro will be in between these two sizes. It'll be a little bit smaller than a 7 Plus and a little bit bigger than a 15 Pro. Is it worth buying the 15 Pro and 512 gig? No, it's not worth it. Installments meant in your contract by definition. That is something you should avoid as much as possible, in my opinion. I agree. You're in a contract that you don't need to be in. And if the answer is, but I don't have the money for it, then don't buy it because <laughs> there's way too many people that are getting into massive financial trouble by buying things that they can't afford. So I would say it's not worth the convenience. Just save up or find a better deal or find a better phone. Maybe if maybe if you don't have $1,100 or $1,200 to spare, then you shouldn't be buying a $1,200 phone. A lot more people need to hear that. If there was some more incentive, like it ended up being way cheaper to own by paying it installments for some reason, I guess. But I pretty much never think that's the case. Usually they rope you in with low installment plans uh, to justify spending more on your cellular. Like AT&T always gives you those great trade-in credits and they say, oh yeah, bring in your old phone, we'll give you a great discount. But then they charge you an arm and a leg for the monthly service. So as long as they can keep you in that contract, then they know you're not going to switch to a cheaper cell phone carrier. Um, let's see. I'm not... <laughs> I like how Jose says, is it worth buying? I'm not interested in the pro version. <laughs> it's like, well, I think you answered your own question, Jose. Is it worth buying a 15 Pro if I don't like the 15 Pro? No. <laughs> you should just repeat what you said before. Don't upgrade based on how good the new phone is. Upgrade based on how bad your current phone is at fulfilling your smartphone need. Yeah. I'll need to put a 
ticker on the screen that just repeats that at all times because it keeps coming up. I don't know when I said that the first time, but at some point I said that and then everybody was like, whoa, that's a really good quote. You should quote. And then I kept seeing it in all the comments and I was like, wow, that little phrase got a big reaction. So I'm going to keep repeating that, I guess, because people seem to like that one. Um, imagine an iPhone 16 with one to 60 hertz display and always on display. My perfect phone. I don't need a tiny two billion hertz display. It's not a gaming laptop. I haven't seen any of those on the market from what I can tell. Whenever a supplier builds an LTPO variable refresh rate display, it tends to easily go to 120 to 1. I don't know of any variable refresh rate displays that go from 60 to 1. Like I, I think if you make it LTPO, it's not that hard to just give it the full 120. But in regards to uh in regards to uh software locking, it would be kind of funny because they haven't said that an always on display is a pro feature, but they did label 120 hertz as pro motion. So to extend battery life, maybe they oh my god. Now the gears are turning in my head. What if they put LTPO panels in the iPhone 17, but they still cap it at 60 hertz and it can go down to one hertz. So you still get always on. So it's like, hey, the entry level iPhone got another pro feature, but they don't give it promotion. They restrict that to the pros, even though via software, they could probably hit 120. They just leave it off. I think Google did something like that with the Pixel 6. Renee Richie had something good. Wait as long as you can and buy the best possible tech you can afford at the time. I kind of agree with I like the waiting part, but then I I I worry about the best buy the best possible tech because there's a lot of people that do not need the best possible tech. Um I wouldn't buy like the most expensive phone just because you can afford it. Um you should you should try to factor in a little bit more of like what do I actually need? Is titanium a need or a want? You know, is an action button a need or a want? And kind of try to draw that line better. Like, what do I need my phone to do? And if you've got all the money, you've got plenty of spending money, then sure, buy whatever you want. Treat it like a toy and just be like, yeah, I don't need titanium, but I want it and I can afford it. So yeah, it's your money. Do what you want. But a lot of people are not in that financial situation, which is why I'm like, okay, I'm not making videos for those people because you're going to buy what you want. You don't really care what I recommend. But what the most common question I always get after all these years, is it worth blank? Should I blank? If you want my advice, I'm going to tell you no. <laughs> Such an Apple move. Apple would software lock that and I would be fine with it. <laughs> yeah, it would probably extend your battery life, right? If the screen's not moving, it goes down to one hertz. And then if it is moving, it only goes up to 60 instead of 120. So Although would would Apple extend the battery or just put a smaller battery capacity in there to make the phone lighter and cheaper? That's more Apple. Concept Central, hey, you already covered it, just joined, but wasn't there a leak that the stackable MagSafe charger is laughing at the mental image of someone? Yes, that's what we talked about at the very beginning of the stream. And I like the idea, just mo mainly because I want you to be able to wirelessly charge the MagSafe battery pack so you don't have to take it off to charge your phone. Um, but yes, it's hilarious to imagine the MagSafe battery packs all just stacking higher. However, now that the iPhone 15s have a charge limiter and you can cap it at 80%, I feel much more comfortable and confident telling people to go with a third-party battery case. Like if I got an iPhone 15 to keep, I would probably... Where are they? I should find some. Um, there's one on Amazon, I think. If you got a third party battery case um, and you just leave the phone capped at 80% all the time, that will be great for your battery health. And um, you don't need to worry about kind of the smartness of the, the Apple battery cases. Yeah, look at this one. 40. No, that's bad reviews. Hold on. Don't buy that one. Let's find a, one with decent reviews. Uh, Four stars is pretty good. Okay, 4.6 stars. Wireless charging case for iPhone 15. Um, 10,000 milliamp hours, which is pretty good. It's not the prettiest thing, but if you're in a pinch, you're traveling or whatever. Um, I just found that after a quick Amazon search. It's $43, and you add 10,000 milliamp hours 
just see that big bulky case on the back. But there's also a probably a battery pack, iPhone 15, MagSafe um, pack. Let's see. Oh, yeah. This one has 4.3 stars, 10,000 milliamp hours. Wow. It's type C. Um, dark blue. Ew, it has USB A. That's gross. But I guess if you have Prime, it's only $28. But, you know, decent reviews. You can prop your phone up with it. And then uh, then you don't have to commit to a full case. So if you get a new phone in the future, the, the battery pack will probably still keep working. So I feel like with the charge limiter, I can justify the third-party battery cases a lot more. Um, Good morning! <laughs> There's a saying that you shouldn't pay more than 30% of your income for housing. There should be a similar saying of other necessity as well. Yeah, that's a good that's a good idea. More than 30% of your income for housing. I like that. With phones, it should be much, much less. As someone who just made the switch to going caseless, I can't even imagine carrying around something that bulky. I don't even think you should carry around most of the time. It's just on those edge cases where you're out and about a lot longer, you're away from a charger for a lot longer, or you're using your phone for something that's more power hungry than just on those edge, get, like for me, it's when I travel. Like I like having a battery bank if I'm traveling because I'm gonna be moving around a bunch and I'm gonna be on my phone a lot at the airport and on the plane. So I'm not gonna have as easy access to chargers, especially at airports overseas. They don't have as many chargers as we have in the US. Um, power banks are nice too, but they, require a cable and then you got to hold the battery bank and the cable goes in between them and stuff it all in your pocket opposed to just something that could snap on the back without a cable and charge it which i like um carl pie's review of the 15 pro i think it's cool that he does those I, i've never watched one before i'm not i'm not watching a lot of tech reviews in my free time <laughs> sorry jose says what i meant to say is it worth Buying the iPhone 15 Plus 512 gig over the 15 Pro Max since I'm not interested in the Pros since all the controversy surrounding them. Eh, I guess it's still a lot of money, but I suppose it's cheaper than the Pro Max. I just, I really don't want the Plus iPhones to succeed because that tells Apple to not make a mini iPhone. But I guess, Jose, in your case, I guess I suppose it makes it. Wait, wait for a used model. You'll get it cheaper if you just wait a few months. Um, I still have the Doji, I do. I was just using it yesterday, actually. So, yeah, your Apple Sheep. I've got an Android phone, and I don't have an iPad. How about that? Um, did I see the updated PS5? I did, but I didn't really notice that much of what they changed. I'm not a gamer, and I don't own any consoles. So, um, yeah, I was not I was not that impressed. I saw some tweets, and they were like, here's the new PS5. And I was like, that's new? What did they do? <laughs> I guess it's a joke, right? Um, yeah, I don't know much about it, but anyway. Um, MX offer for 80 off and AirPods Pro USB-C deal. I got them for $100. That's not bad. Sabotage the Plus. No, I sold it. iPad Pro is gone. I don't own it anymore. I, I handed it off. I don't own the Apple Pencil. I don't have any of the accessories for the iPad. It's It's all gone now. All done with it. And I'm happy. I haven't missed it at all. I haven't been in any situations where I'm like, man, I could really go for an iPad right now. I really need an iPad. Nope. But, you know, uh, based Sith. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the names you guys come up with are so glorious. I love it. Um, they said two USB-C ports up front now. I guess that's the new change with the PS5. Um, okay, cool. The more I was thinking about what is Apple going to come up with for an ultra iPhone, the more I started realizing they should make an iPhone ultra with USB-C on both sides. Can you imagine? Or maybe if not on both sides, do them two on the bottom. Can you imagine? Make a giant brick iPhone. It looks kind of like, where's the, where's the concept art? I got to find it. Someone did a really good job with it. They took the Apple Watch Ultra design. Yes. Who did this one? Yosef Muhammad. Good job. Take the Apple Watch Ultra design. I love the Doji phone. I got to be honest with you. Like, it's not 
pretty. It's not trying to be something that it, it just knows what it is. It's trying to be a function first phone. Utility comes first with that phone and they gave it the biggest possible battery. You know, my freaking, our iPhones have like 3000, maybe 4,000 milliamp hours. The Doji has 20,000 milliamp hours. And every time I show it to people, they're always impressed. They're always like, that's kind of awesome. I kind of love that. That's awesome. That's sweet. And then Apple is talking about or thinking about making an Ultra, apparently. I love that idea of what if someone didn't care about the aesthetics that much? What if they just wanted a really utility, functional, focused phone and they didn't care how much it cost? Just make a, you know, just go all out. Make a freaking... $1,500 or $1,800 iPhone with a massive battery, give it 10,000, 15,000 milliamp hours, try to make the cameras flush on the back. And imagine how that could affect the cameras. How much better could the cameras get if you just made the whole phone way thicker, like doji levels of thickness. And then um, huge battery, like, like on the ultra Apple watch, the battery is twice the length of a normal Apple watch. So I would want something similar for the iPhone. If you're going to make an iPhone Ultra, I want double the battery life. If the if the Pro Max gives us 29 hours of video playback, give me 60 hours of video playback on the iPhone Ultra. Just make like an absurdly thick, heavy, expensive, but great, super capable. And yeah, put two USB-C ports on it. Why not? One on the horizontal side oh that'd be an interesting idea because then you could use it in landscape and power it on its side that'd be kind of cool yeah you could have one usb-c port for writing footage or, or you know pictures and stuff or outputting to an external monitor and then the other port to power it that would be so cool the more i think about it the more i like that idea i want i want an iphone with two usb-c ports in like a ten thousand plus milliamp hour if I can't get my mini iPhone, which is what I was asking for all these years, please, Apple, make an iPhone 15 mini. You know, give me USB-C on a super portable. Okay, if you're not going to give me that, then go all the way. If you want to go big, let's just go huge. Seven-inch display, massive battery, super durable. Um, it can take a beating, super water-resistant. You know, you can dive with this thing or something. What about the heat while charging and using the other port? That's fine. Just don't charge it as fast. How do MacBooks do it? The MacBook Air doesn't have any fans in it. And the iPhone doesn't have a chip as big as the, as power hungry as the MacBook. The iPad has an M2 chip and it doesn't have any fans in it. But it has USB-C and Thunderbolt and everything. Hasael says, I am for this just to hear Tim Cook say, Look, we've made the thickest iPhone. This iPhone is thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. Imagine the iPhone Ultron stage. We invented a new battery technology to have three times the battery at half the size. They would just put in a tinier battery and get the same battery life. Um, Kind of strange phones have become like this when you really think about it. Phones used to just be telephones. No one cared what they looked or anything. Yeah, I don't even really like calling them smartphones because the phone is like the last thing I use it for. I get worried when someone wants to call me. Like this morning, my grandma was like, call me right now. She was like, call. <laughs> and I was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And we called her and she's just like, oh, this, nothing. I just, I thought uh, it would be easier to explain. We were figuring out some furniture stuff and she was just like, this will be easier to figure out if I can just talk to you. I don't want to have to text it. You know, people of the older generations tend to just be like, let me just call you. And the younger generation's like, they're calling me. What's wrong? Why are they calling me? What's going on? If Apple brings back the mini iPhone, would you wait until it gets cheaper? Uh, probably. Yeah, sure. Maybe. I don't know. Depends. Again, it all comes back to how is my current phone? If my current phone really sucks and we're really close to the launch of the new phone, then maybe I wouldn't wait. Maybe I'll be like, you know what? I can't get by with the iPhone 11 anymore. It's not cutting me, it's not getting me through the day or whatever. I just, I need a new phone as soon as possible. Then yeah, I'll probably just wait for the new one and then buy it on launch day and switch to that. Um, your grandma was like, good morning. <laughs> yeah. You seen that guy on TikTok that impersonate? Yeah, I retweeted him. He was hilarious. He was, he was just, <laughs> gotta find that guy. Where is it? I'm going to. 
show it to you because it made me laugh so hard. Oh my God, I got too many notifications to keep up with. It was, it was so funny. Yes. Hear what he says at the beginning. It is glorious. Good morning. Oh, shut the hell up. <laughs> Oh, shut the hell up. <laughs> He's so good at it. Yeah. I retweeted him because I was like, this guy's my inspiration. Not Tim Cook. I'm not trying to sound like Tim Cook. I'm trying to sound like that guy because he, I agree with uh, Scherzer here. This dude sounds more like Tim Cook than Tim Cook does. What would you say is your biggest pet peeve of your iPhone 11? It's too big. Honestly, um, that's about it. I like it. Face ID works. It's comfortable in the hand. Um, but yeah, I miss the I miss the iPhone 10 size, but I prefer the iPhone 11 software features. Cause even for the thumbnail I made for today's live stream, I have to use subject lift, and um, my iPhone 10 didn't get that. iPhone 10 didn't even get iOS 17, right? So I would have kept the SE2, um, but I had to do the whole musical chair switcheroo for the family thing. One family member needed the SE2 and my wife didn't want the iPhone 11. So I ended up with the iPhone 11, but it's fine. It's, it's nothing really wrong with it. I just, I prefer it if it was a little smaller. Um, that's not to say I don't mind, I don't like big phones. I like big phones. I just want them to go crazy, like ultra, you know, I want huge phone. If you're going to be big, go big. And if you're going to be small, go real small. You know, like there's advantages to a really small phone and there's advantages to a really big phone. But to me, the 6.1 inch size is just like the worst of both. It's not small enough to be super compact and comfortable. And it's not big enough to unlock a lot of the advantages of having that bigger screen and the bigger battery. So I'm like, this is just kind of the worst of both, in my opinion. I don't like the mid-tier phones. But iPhone 15 was a lot lighter, so I was like, okay, this one's not too bad. I mean, it's not as good as a mini, but it's they rounded the edges and made them a little bit more comfortable, and they reduced the weight on the iPhone 15 a lot, so it felt very comfortable in the hand. I was like, okay, it's it's pretty good, but I would rather I would rather them just go huge. If you if we're not gonna get my mini iPhone, this is this is what I want: iPhone 16 Ultra. Just go, just go brick. Go full on Doogee phone because the Doogee phone's awesome. Um, are the those notifications solely for Talos of Tech? Yes, those do not count the other Talos of accounts. Um, how long do these streams go for? I literally joined in the beginning, left, applied to college, came back. I'm not joking. I left to submit a college application. <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of, as I have time, there's not. There's not a ton of tech news to talk about right now, which is if there's not that much news going on, I tend to do longer streams because it's a bit more of a fun, real-time uh, feedback loop of like, what are you guys interested in? What do you guys want to talk about? And then I see what you talk about, and then I give my opinion, and then you guys give your opinion back, and we can have a more real-time conversation opposed to the videos, which is me reading the news, trying to guess what you're interested in, make a video on it, and then hope that you like it. But a lot of you probably won't, or a lot of you won't agree. And it's just a lot more complicated that way, opposed to just live streaming, which is less technically fun because there's less editing and um, obviously it goes on for much longer. So it's not as condensed down, you know, easy to watch. It's like, okay, who has time to watch these whole streams? I don't really care if you watch the whole stream or not. That's not my problem. But, um, for the people who like the real-time interaction, it's fun. And if you miss it, you can watch it or listen to it after the fact. I turn these into podcasts on Apple Podcasts and um, Spotify. You can listen to them. Do I use Apple Maps or Google Maps? I used to use Apple Maps until I got my new car. My new car is powered by Google Maps and it has that built in. So I use Google Maps, but they suck. It gives me horrible directions all the time. It always tells me to go through these terrible routes and it takes me through these sketchy alleyways and it has me do these weird turns and it doesn't understand the construction zones so it tells me to go around them even though it's faster to go through them and um i hate it i know it's anecdotal i've heard other people tell me google maps is so much better but in my own experience google maps has never been better than apple maps for me ever do i miss apple music sing on the go oh yeah every day i miss it um no notes more skits but otherwise no notes my guy <laughs> thanks mark um, I like big phones and I cannot lie. 
Just my broken iPad or volume a little low based off of a loud ad before the... <laughs> well, I tend to try to go quieter, I guess, because it's live and, you know, some people are just going to tune in right away. Um, Evan says, I enjoy watching the streams. I've been watching the streams for months. Thank you. I enjoy the streams too. They're a lot easier for me because I... That's what I... I don't like filming things. I don't really like editing. I have to film and edit to make my videos, but... I mainly just like talking about this stuff. I like talking about what Apple's going to do or what Apple should do or what's rumored to come out and all that. That's more fun for me. And I get to just focus on the fun stuff when I live stream. But of course, live streams are a lot more niche because only a few people catch them live. And if you watch them not live, it's less fun because it's too long and it's not as condensed and there's less skits and stuff like that. So the live streaming is fun for me. So when there's not that much news and I'm like, I don't really know what I'm going to make a video on today. Yeah, let's just stream so I can see what is on your guys' mind. Sometimes if you all ask about one thing in particular, it gives me ideas and I'm like, okay, now there's a, a few topics I could dive into in a dedicated video so that more people could watch it. Um, <laughs> Cameron Chris Holm says, just joined. So sorry if you've already answered, but Spotify or Apple Music? Neither. I am a full-time... YouTube music enjoyer. Oh, the mask is freaked out. Look at that. It's right there on the home screen. There's no Apple Music. There's no Spotify to be seen, but there is YouTube because it's included in YouTube Premium, which is a great deal, and it helps support your support uh, support your creators. Um, when you use it with Dynamic Island, Apple Maps is a no brainer. I'm sure it's helpful, but it's probably not going to be better than having it on the big screen in the car because my screen in my car is like 15 inches and even the best iPhone isn't going to be as easy to see as that. So um, I thought Tesla's maps are Google's images, but the navigation was proprietary. Yeah, you're probably right. It's something like that. But whatever Tesla uses is not good. I want Apple Maps in the car, <laughs> but I don't want to use my phone because the phone screen is way smaller. It's much easier to see the big screen. Um, projecting, learned about it from therapy. I was gifted a group. <laughs> if you could hypothetically get your old big office back for free, would you move Telosev back there? Uh, it's so far from where I am now, so not really. <laughs> it would be a lot of additional driving. Um, I could get it for free. I don't know. I guess maybe I would try it, but I kind of, I, I kind of like not having to drive to work. It's very nice to just kind of wake up and you're there. Saves a lot of time, saves a lot of money. It's better for the environment. Um, so probably not. I mean, part of the reason, I don't know if you remember, but that big office we had was, it was fun to fill stuff with, but honestly, we weren't really utilizing that much space. We didn't have a need for that much space. Um, I don't think I said I hate filming and editing. Did I say hate? Sorry if I said hate. What I mean is I don't, that's not the reason I do this job. I didn't become a YouTuber because I love filming and editing. I, I liked making tech videos because I liked sharing my thoughts and my ideas. I, I enjoy thinking and talking about this stuff. I'm not obsessed with the production of it, which is often why I'll record videos off a of phone or I will edit things really quickly and not put a lot of thought into the editing because I'm like, that's not why I do this. I don't think people are watching me for my editing. I don't think I'm doing this for the editing. I'm doing this because I'm interested in the subject matter and the topics and the news, and I want to talk about that. The live streaming lets me just cut straight to the news and straight to the topics and the ideas. Um, but um, if I could get the old office back, I, I don't know what I would do with all that space. And honestly, when we take trips as often as we do, it would be kind of wasted. I would be like having all that room and then no one would be in it for like months out of the year. So <laughs> Lou has unbox therapy. Drew has Apple therapy. Yeah, there you go. Um, we think of companies offering lifetime subscriptions for big upfront payment. I love that idea. Whenever they offer it, I'm always very curious about it because I've, I've often wondered like if Netflix was like, I don't know. It's fun to do the math. I like how people I like when people start thinking about long-term investments. Like we were just watching this trashy reality TV show um me and my wife and uh there was this one person, you know, they were it was a couple and they were arguing and one person is kind of the younger less experienced partner in the couple and was saying like we should we should buy it was in another country so the 
real estate's cheaper and stuff. But they were like, we should buy this $20,000 house and rent it out so we have a form of income. And the more experienced person was like, uh, that's not worth it because here we're only going to rent it out for like 100 or 200 bucks a month. So we wouldn't even make money on that investment for another you know, 15 years or something. Um, so that it's that kind of thought process that you have to have whenever a, a service or a company offers like a lifetime license. Um, you got to do the math. How long are, is this company going to be in service? Um, usually big companies that are well established don't offer those because they plan to be around and it's in their financial interest to keep charging you monthly because they're going to make way more off of you that way. But yeah, if uh, for whatever reason, YouTube or Netflix or something was like, we'll offer you a lifetime license for this much, whether it's, I don't know, $2,000, $3,000, I'd be very tempted to just be like, wow, for the rest of my life, I have access to all the content that's on there. That would be really cool. But you're just making a bet that the company's not going to go bankrupt or maybe get bought out and then the terms change or something. Um so if there's no risk of that happening, I would totally do it. But there's usually some form of risk. Uh, let's see. Try Bing Maps, then you'll see how good both Apple Maps and Google Maps are. I don't know how to get Bing Maps in the car, but I'm still on Mint Mobile. Internet provider jumped again. I recall that was quite the ordeal for this channel. Yeah, I'm still on T-Mobile Home Internet. It's good enough. It's not perfect. It gets a little spotty here and there, but for the most part, it's very stable and reliable. And the best part is it's very cheap. Um, it's the cheapest internet I've ever had. Home internet. I turned off lossless on my 15 Pro for smaller files to download all my music onto my phone. I haven't noticed a single difference in sound quality. I would try to convince myself I was an audio <laughs> That is hilarious. Wow. <laughs> I like hearing that. I tried to see if I could tell a difference and I couldn't. Bummer. Um, tell your bestie to bring back the lifetime deal on Mint. Well, Mint never had a lifetime deal, but they did have a 25-year deal, which I'm not even convinced was that great because it was locked in at, I think, four gigs a month, which isn't amazing. But technically, if you extrapolated it out, it was going to cost something like $8 a month for cell phone service for 25 years. But what is four gigabytes of cell data going to be worth in 20 years? That's probably the, the biggest issue. I love Shark Tank, yes. I don't watch like every episode, but anytime I can. It, they upload most of it on YouTube. I watch a lot of Shark Tank on YouTube. You do need very good speakers for lossless, and you need a way to connect to the device so that it can output the lossless signal. If you're using Bluetooth headphones, you're never going to notice. doesn't matter if the phone is actually playing it, but um, I'm curious about this article now. Everything we know about the high-end iPhone 16. doesn't seem like there's been any recent changes. Um, Apple's most expensive and feature-rich iPhone. We don't have too much insights. Mark Gurman considered a high-end iPhone in 2024 at the earliest. Um, he's saying, I think that it would be, man, Lucid, you're spending too much money on advertising. Nobody wants your cars. Switch to Nax. It could even have a higher-end iPhone in above po uh, both Pro models, said German. Internally, the company has discussed doing just that, potentially in time for the 2024 iPhone release. And this was in February. Wow, this was a long time ago. Okay, well, hopefully he's right. Do I miss my 12 Mini? Uh, Yeah, I liked it, but my sister has it now, and she's enjoying it, so I'm not going to take it away from her. But yeah, I would take a 12 mini right now if I could trade it for my iPhone 11. Uh, let's see. As long as I hear the difference between Beethoven and Ed Sheeran, I'm not concerned about my hearing. <laughs> well said. Well said. Um, what time am I streaming until? What time is it? Oh, my God. It's 420. Jeez. All right. Well, I've been live streaming for a while, and I've had a lot of fun. So I, I should probably wrap up. I think we've got places to be tonight oh yeah we do shoot okay well thank you all for uh super chatting and uh your channel members for your support uh i'll probably have a few video ideas for you guys to vote on um shortly after this and see what what should i dive into next and uh, i hope you have an excellent rest of your day take care all bye bye